Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Katie Halper Show live special, uh, special uh, live stream that we're just putting together. And we're putting it together because honestly, the world is kind of going crazy, falling apart. Um, and everyone's speculating on stuff um, without really knowing. So I thought we should have a, a podcast, we should have a live stream, take advantage of the fact that um, there's some stories that no one else is talking about. We're going to talk not about Trump, because who the hell knows? And honestly, while we're streaming, he could die. I'm not saying that in a whatever-ish way. Um, he could die, though. But so what am I going to do? Have a doctor on to talk about it? Yes. Okay. I did try that. But then I'm going to have him on another time. He was having dinner with his in-laws, which was kind of rude of him. But I was like, you know what? Forget the Trump stuff. Let's talk about other leaders, how other leaders have dealt with COVID because Janine Añez had it in Bolivia. Um, Boris Johnson had it and some Russians had it and now Trump. So I know it's crazy. So I want to come. So here's who I have coming on. Ready? First, later we'll have James Adomian, but now we're going to have on Victor Puji from Hi, Victor. How are you? Hi, Katie. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, one second. Let me just say. Just going to get it out of the way for the haters that you don't yeah. look like you're crying, Katie. Thank you. Um, so, okay. Victor, thank you for coming. Tell us um, what insights you have as someone who is lives in Brazil. Um, you are Brazilian. Thank you for coming yeah. on. Um, and by the way, um, big, big news guys, I got to say some intercept related news. Mehdi Hassan has left the intercept. I'm not saying anything positive or negative, but does anyone know where he's going? Guess. Oh, you're getting a lot of compliments, Victor, by the way, they're oh, kind of great. objectifying though. So I don't want to anyone guess where I try to look to I just want to let you know that I don't want to get caught up in the Maddie discourse. I know. All right. You know, I'll say it later. We'll say it later. He has no comment. All right. (laughs) Yeah. No comment. No further. No further comment. Can I at least tell them where it is here? You want to go get a glass of water while I tell them or you want to like, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be. Okay. MSNBC. NBC, not MSNBC. Sorry. NBC Peacock something. All right. God, I just want to tell you in front of an intercept. Shein. So let us talk about the real news. Um, first of all, well, I kind of want to ask you how you got started at the intercept. Um, but let's first talk about what it was like when Trump ally was diagnosed with Bolsonaro and how you found out and what the effect on the country was. Well, I mean, it, it was uh, a shit show. I mean, can we say that? Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. 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 It was a shit show. It, it had been right. I, I, I guess not many American listeners would be that informed about Brazil, but your listeners will because you keep covering it very well. But uh, yeah, I mean, the whole COVID situation here in Brazil with Bolsonaro is absolutely chaotic uh, in the sense that there is really no government, uh, governmental policy in in the federal level, in the presidential level. So I just punted it kind of to the governors and to the, the local governments and and just keeps like deflecting the blame and just throwing it onto them so from the start it was pretty chaotic and uh there's actually like two different instances of when we thought bolsonaro had covid first of which turned out he didn't have or at least that's what the story became and then he did have later but i think actually the 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 time he didn't really have covid is the 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 one that's the most fun because um he had just been to Mar-a-Lago. He was in, in Florida to, to meet with Trump in May, uh, early May. And uh, as they came back, him and his entourage, people around him started um, testing positive, uh, which was kind of like cool because it became a countrywide soap opera of like, does the president have it? Like his aide has it, another aide has it, another aide has it. And then it became even because uh, the mystery became if he had given it to Trump. 
right. uh, which was when, uh, which was like the, the biggest uh, question around Brazil. And there was a whole mess because uh, his son, his like largest failed son, um, he's just like Trump. He is like followed about by his adult children that are like right. unbearably dumb. Uh, but uh, he had given a, an, an uh, confirmed it to to Fox News to John Roberts uh, that he had tested positive, and then he backtracked it, and no one quite believed it. But you know, it was up in the air like that. How how a lot of the time things are with Bolsonaro. But then, you know, the, the bottom line was that he didn't really have COVID, but just most of his AIDS. But um, that first moment was kind of a, a preview of what would happen because, um, you know, while he hadn't been confirmed if he had it or he didn't, he, it was confirmed that he, were, he was near people who had tested positive. And nonetheless, he was just like walking around, meeting people, shaking hands, like coffee on people and you know, being his like himself normally, even though he had potentially had COVID. Uh, but then in June, in July rather, uh, he did actually get COVID. Uh, and it just became clear how totally inadequate any anything was because he just kept meeting with people. There was like no quarantine, people were going in and out. Uh, he actually gave an interview to reporters confirming he was sick. And during that interview, he was like, yeah, well, yeah, I tested positive. That's so sad. But I'm going to remove my mask to show you how I'm actually healthy. So, yeah, it was just absolutely insane. But he was man and he, he was able to kind of walk it out in a way that I don't think Trump will be because he didn't really get very sick. So it worked in his favor because you could say, see, it's not a big deal. Like, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fine. Right. And he was just meeting people and he, it's likely that he spread it to, to some people, which is crazy. And what is it like in Brazil? I mean, I know it's the second highest number of cases, right? After United, after the United States, um, what's it like? Uh, walking around, are people in masks? Do people wear masks in certain neighborhood and not in others? What's the what's it like there for you? Well, uh, f in, in the beginning, it was like, I guess how it was everywhere else. We're like, oh my God, this is happening. So everyone kind of took it very seriously for a while. But then uh, people started to trying to get a, a public you know, response, an institutional response, because you can't just stay home if you don't have any support from the government and stuff, right? So uh, there was like different ways people were trying to, to figure out. And uh, a lot of the local governors took the lead by uh, issuing lockdown orders for, for the, the states that they governed. And Bolsonaro, as the president, kind of fought them and the, saying that you can't do that because his concern was with the economy, right? His main selling point was that, oh, I may be crazy, but the economy is doing well or, or maybe it wasn't doing that well, but it was the promise that we're going to get the economy back in order. We have this neoliberal minister that's going to do all these like neoliberal reforms and then we're going to privatize everything and everything's going to be great. That was, that was his selling point. That's how he got elected and that, that's what he was trying to do. Although that neoliberal minister who is... Uh, Chicago educated and who worked in Chile doing during the Pinochet years. So okay. that's the, the kind of person that he is. Doesn't really seem to be that brilliant because he didn't really do anything that he promised to do, which is good because the things that he promised to do were bad things. Uh, anyway, so he was trying to, to save the economy uh, in that buffoonish way. And then uh, in Congress, uh, the opposition started articulating to create a policy. And then they, they uh, created a, a mainly the opposition parties in Congress. Uh, and not just the left-wing opposition, to be fair. The, mainly like a lot of the political spectrum ended up selling on a, on a policy that I think was uh, good and, and the right thing to do, which is the, an emergency assistance just mailing checks to people so that they could stay home. Um, but Bolsonaro was against that. Obviously now he's, he's claiming credit for that, now that it's it's popular. But he was against that and he was fighting against 
every step of the way because um, his political calculus in, in the way I see it was uh, he can't let anyone shine. So anyone that was seen to be like doing a great job, uh, he had to immediately like clip the wings. So he had a, a, a health minister who is a conservative right wing guy. His main thing, he became his health minister basically uh, because of his not notoriety from being opposed to the Cuban doctors, that there was a policy under the Workers' Party that to bring Cuban doctors to assist with the, with the medic medical treatment in, of poor communities that are underserved, which was a great thing to do. It was super popular. It was great because it's like high quality care in, in poor communities. But, you know, you know how things are it was like oh my god these are cuban doctors you're communists you're gonna like do a communist communist plot you know you've seen right. all all of this discourse already uh, so this guy was famous for for being anti this and that's how he became bolsonaro's minister he back backtracked this false but he's a doctor so like even though he's like right wing and and you know conservative he is like he sees a disease and it's like, oh my God, this is a serious thing. We, we got to do something. And he was d doing daily briefings. He was, uh, you know, being normal. But I guess in a way you can compare him to Dr. Falsi. Uh, I don't know how well the, the analogy works, yeah. like if you go too deep into it, but I think it's it's a fair, like superficial comparison. Uh, Bolsonaro felt threatened by him, fired him, fired him. I mean, threatened to fire him for a week and then ended up finally firing, huge shitstorm. Pick a new guy, other doctor. Uh, same thing happens basically. It's like even further right guy, even more uh, willing to do whatever Bolsonaro tells him. But even him, he was like, "No, look, we, we got to do something." Fires this guy. So now the the health minister is not a doctor; he's like a, a military dude. Uh, so there's basically no national health policy. The the policy is uh, spread out like in a constellation of local governments and local state governments. And that's how the, the COVID policy has been. Uh, the only federal thing was the, the checks that they were issued. Uh, so that's how it is. Utter chaos, there's no testing uh, on, a, on a countrywide scale. Uh, and they've just been using the COVID crisis as kind of like a distraction to get all their awful shit done. How, how so? What, what do you mean as a, a distraction? Uh, I think that... There was something, there was a, a, the drama is so, just so intense, but there was a, a ministerial uh, meeting with all the ministers that was recorded and there was like a whole fight and justice because they wanted to get this recording out and then they ended up getting this recording out. So we got to watch uh, a ministerial meeting with all the high level cabinet positions meeting. It was like in the height of the COVID crisis and they, they just don't talk about COVID. That just shows how focused they are in, in fighting this. But the environmental minister, uh, the guy who's utterly destroying everything, he, he basically said like explicitly, he's recorded saying, we should, uh, while the media is talking about COVID, we should take the opportunity while they're distracted and uh, just let it all loose on the environmental policy and cut everything out. So that's the main example because it was so shocking to see the, the environmental minister saying while wow, the press is distracted with covid let's get all of our stuff done so this is kind of the things that they're doing um so yeah just chaos totally chaotic wow. and just so people know i mean i understand what you're saying that it sounds like they're different right trump looks like he's i mean he is at walter reed so it looks a bit yeah. more serious than um than Bolsonaro's case, but um, if Trump survives, I mean, he could e he could easily say right that if Trump survives and fully recovers, let's say, I still think he can do what Bolsonaro did, which is say, look, I'm obviously in good shape, which is why I survived, and look, mm -hmm. see, I was right that I was like uh, not to play it down. Although it's kind of incredible that he has said on record, and we know this, that he downplayed it. Yeah, I mean. I don't, there's so many missed opportunities for Biden. I talked about this on Useful Idiots, but like he should be, I mean, he should have said young people can get it. He should have named a couple of people who died. I mean, politicians are so good at these things, right? I met a woman in 
in yeah, um, exactly. Springfield, whatever state. And she told me, yeah. blah, 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 just name pe some people who like died. Mother of two children. And then yeah, she exactly. was like, yeah. Right. Right. So name a, exactly. That's what you should do. Anyway, he didn't do that. But um, yeah. my worry is that Trump will, if he survives and is in good health, he'll be like, yeah, I was, I'm in great health. Nothing mm -hmm. happened. And that's why I didn't, you know, and I didn't need to take these crazy precautions. And I, you know, I didn't wear a mask and I got it and look what happened. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, it is so sad because Biden like never misses the opportunity to miss an opportunity. Right. And Trump, on the other hand, always like makes an opportunity out of things that yeah, shouldn't exactly. be opportunities for right. him. So right. uh, it could go wrong. But I think that uh, if he does, I mean, it's hard to tell. It's just happening. Like everything yeah. is shrouded in like layers and layers of like right. unknowns. What was it? The George Bush quote? There's like the non-unknowns. Oh, yeah. Unknown unknowns and unknowns. And unknown yeah. unknowns. That was actually, um, uh, what's his name? Not Bush. Uh, his Rumsfeld, Dick, Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld. Yeah. Who, was, who, by the yeah. way, people yeah. listed one year as one of the 50 most beautiful people. They should really? have, if they had like a war criminals edition, he would be well, up there just yeah, because he's not hideous. Good. And you have like David Frum and uh, Henry Kissinger, so like the bar is very low. He could yeah. be a supermodel among I mean, war criminals, but for a civilian, no, yeah. on the like the Hague hottest, yeah, the hottest yeah. of the Hague, the Hague's hottest. Yeah. That's good. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, it's too bad that, you know, whatever. Let's not get into the whole. Yeah. And and, so, and let's talk crimes. about um, uh, let's, what Bolsonaro, this wasn't his only time uh, cheating death. He got stabbed, right? During his first, yeah. during his, um, what happened? Can I mean, you talk about what happened there? I, I think that is probably the, the most important event of the, of the election season. It was while everything was still up in the air. And Bolsonaro was stabbed, and it was it was a, a really terrible thing that actually happened. And and it could be argued that that's when he became electable, right? Because he was an extremist guy, and he was aggressive and mean and awful, right? And then he became like a, a sympathetic character because right. he was on the hospital having been stabbed by a crazy person. Right. Uh, and I think there's there's something else, which is that the center right candidate, because a lot of the time the discourse around Trump and uh, Bolsonaro is that the, the left wing is as a, a left wing having lost and given place to the far right. I would argue that it was actually the center right that collapsed that allowed for the for the far right to to rise. So like what you would expect in the Republican Party, like the Marco Rubio's or the right. Jeb Bush's, they were the ones that collapsed, not the left wing. But whatever. This is, um here in Brazil, the center right candidate was the the kind of like the establishment guy that everyone wanted, you know, all the powers that be wanted him to have been elected and not Bolsonaro because Bolsonaro was actually dangerous for them. Most of the, I guess, similar to Trump in, in yeah. some ways. Yeah. Uh, so that center right guy, his campaign was uh, focused on, on Bolsonaro, not letting Bolsonaro grow. He would be the, the, the polarization with the left. He would win. Right. When Bolsonaro was stabbed, all his attack ads against Bolsonaro, they had to pocket, pull it back, attack the left. And then Bolsonaro was like, you know, no one was, was attacking him. Right. It was so so I think that, that is the most important thing stabbed. that happened. Yeah. And he didn't even like, the guy who stabbed him was mentally ill, right? Who was the person who stabbed yeah. him? Yeah. Uh, he is a uh, mentally ill guy that, that is the, he has been... Uh, taken by like these forensic psychologist guys like three or four times have attested him as being mentally ill but of course there is a, a, a an awkward thing that he was once uh, a member of a left-wing political mm. party right uh so you know he gets muddled right, right, and so, complicated right. and then it becomes like the left is killing bolsonaro it's just a, a, the whole thing is is a tragedy right like it, it, it if i could delete that day from the from brazilian right. history god knows what would happen differently didn't he do something where he like hid in his house? He was like, I don't feel well. Oh, is that my, fr I had Mari Mariana, Mariana Shimoes. Is that how you, I mean, it's yeah. you know, the journalist from, I had her on the show and she told me about it. I got to have her back on. Uh, during the, there, there are televised debates here in Brazil, just like in the U S and uh -huh. Bolsonaro didn't go to, to the debates using him having been stabbed as an excuse, even though he was like giving interviews and going out. But That's he was, was he, he really is terrible at, at a debate. He's terrible like doing anything, right? right. I mean, he is just a, a, a wild character. Uh, so he didn't go to the debates uh, because he would say like, oh no, I am a, 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 you know, I've just stabbed. I can't 
I'm not healthy to do this. So, so again, it was like another debate that no one could attack him and he just right. won by yeah. default by, by not, because if he was the, the elephant in the room and no one could attack him directly. Right. The sympathetic uh, elephant yeah, it, in the room. Yeah. yeah. He became a sympathetic guy, which is remarkable because he's the most unsympathetic person like ever. Right. Um, and you know, it's funny because Virgil Texas, who got a guy on the show from Chapo Trap House, he, um, here I just put Victor's um Twitter handle in there. Actually, oh, yeah, you can't click on it, so I'm not going to put it, I'll just write it out. Um, in fact, I should do it with mine too. Um, he 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 d said something like Biden's going to be really stupid and like, um, cancel all his negative campaign, uh, negative ads uh, advertising on Trump. And of course he did. Now, the he thing is, exactly there's right. a way to do this where you don't, like, you can make it clear that you hope he gets better, but you also are campaigning against him. But, yeah. uh, yeah, it's kind of like, I hope he recovers so I can defeat him and like, yeah, exactly. Put an end to his project. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, Biden never does the obviously like beneficial thing and always like does a crazy, like, thing that appeals to this imaginary like voter who's on the fence like I, right I, yeah, yeah the, the, the so mythical moderate voter yeah yeah um the, who doesn't exist but it's so yeah. the, i mean we talked about this who was i talking about the, the other day oh david sirota check out everyone by the way has everyone i'm gonna tell you about david sirota in a second but has everyone liked this stream and shared it go share it on your uh victor i i tagged you so you should share it okay retweet i will it. we'll take a little retweeted. social media break i'm gonna, yeah, do, um, I'm gonna do this now why did i bring this up though what was i just saying what were we just saying oh about whether okay i'll come back to it remind me i brought up david sirota remind me when i get back okay and do a quick instagram thing and bajanger while you you do this gate i'm going to take the chance to say that when you reach out to me about doing this i was listening to useful idiots oh great and it was great because i'm like so addicted to watching love for F country it's just so oh, good yeah and yeah. i'm so excited to hear it so i'm like it just began the interview and it's, oh, it's okay really yeah, awesome you I'm guys so um yeah check out the latest um i'm so bad at instagram i'm trying to do a live thing and i can't remember how to do it but check out the latest um uh episode of useful idiots because who do we have on? None other than Michael K. Williams, who plays Omar on The That's Wire. Really good. It was really funny. It was like a question from me about politics and then a question from Matt Taibbi about Omar. A question from me about politics, a question from Matt about Omar. It was really cute. Very, very cute. Um, let me just see. Let me also, so I'm putting this thing in. Uh, ah, my dad. Let me call him back later. <laughs> my, do your parents do this, by the way? He's oh, my dad's always like, call me ASAP. Yeah. And it's like all caps, and I call him. He's like, hi, how are you? How are the dogs? Yeah, I mean, I think it's if you become a parent, like as soon as you have a kid, you like start doing that. Yes. What getting interrupting your kids at inopportune moments? Yeah, and just just being urgent about things that are oh, urgent, true, yeah, and yeah. being like uh, nonchalant right. about things that are actually urgent. Yeah, my mom is not like that. My dad is. Um, uh, let me just see. Uh, let me just. Uh, I was doing an Instagram thing. I think I got it. I want to do a live thing, but I honestly don't even. I don't know how to go live. So let me just. Sorry. Let me just. I was tweeting. I was Instagramming this thing so people come over. And then my dad called. I just told him I was streaming. All right. You know, never say that this show is anything but real talk. Yeah. Right. All right. Only the um, pros can do it live, Katie. Only the pros can do it live, yeah. Um, so anyone have any questions for Victor about Bolsonaro or about, um, you know, how to deal with the plague when your president has it? Yeah, just don't live in a country where the president gets the plague. That's yeah, I mean, advice. I don't know what country that is, though. Yeah. Uh, There's, like, less cases in Vietnam than there are in the White House. Less ca fewer cases in Vietnam in than the in the country White House? of Vietnam than in, than in the White House. How do they keep it? You know what? I should next within a week I'm gonna have a show that looks at um uh the way that like Kerala has contained it, uh Kerala India the way Cuba's contained yeah. it. That's a good. Uh, what do these places have in common, Kate? What is the the common thing that unites Cuba, Vietnam, and Kerala? Yeah, true. 
In case people don't know, Kerala is a communist state in India. Yeah. Yeah. How is Lula? People want to know. Yeah, Lula is super active, which is refreshing to see. We are just entering uh, local government elections uh, in November, so the campaign has just started. And it is the first uh, election season with after Bolsonaro having been elected, so this is going to be a, a really important task for us to know. Oh, um, don't click, it's just bad. It's not a huge deal, but no, oh, yeah. Sound. yeah. I would click hers. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Uh, so it is the first time that we are facing elections. The, the left is less divided than it was when Bolsonaro was elected, it's still not quite there yet in terms of being united, but. I would argue that there's been some progress. So there's some interesting polls to watch. Um, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo are, are, I would say, the most important ones to, to be take a look at if you're an election nerd around the world. And um, and so in general, though, just to to like re sum up the the question of COVID presidents, it harmed him. It helped him uh, politically. I think it it. Um, it's hard to, I think it didn't harm him. It, it definitely didn't harm him. Uh, him being able to get COVID and just keep on keeping on was good for him right. because it, it helped him keep downplaying and just maintain the status quo. It also made it, uh, awkward for the opposition again. Like, how are you going right. to be a guy that's sick? Uh, but it, it just, it, we're living in a state of like permanent crisis in Brazil. So it was just like another thing that was adding to the noise right. and another layer of like make it impossible for a coherent opposition message to clear through the noise. And what's the status with Lula right now? Lula is free uh, out and about, but maintaining social isolation. He is uh, strongly campaigning in, in local elections for his candidates, but he does not have his political rights restored, so he's not able to run for anything. Uh, there will be a judgment on that shortly, that it's going to be judging whether the judge, Judge Moro, who is the right. the villain of the Lava Jato story, if you're going to put it like that, uh, will be judged for not being having been impartial on, his, on Lula's judgment. Uh, hard to tell the forecast the result of that, but there are some clear movements that Judge Moro has been losing some uh, some of his prestige. So uh, the chances of Lula getting a positive uh, result on his trial are better, looking better today than they were maybe a year ago. And what is so? What is the official status? He was released, but not given full rights. So what was that? He was released from. He was not officially declared innocent yet. But he was. It was decided that he didn't really have to wait in prison because um, uh, it's just like there's a, a question. The Constitution of Brazil says you can't be jailed unless you're uh, you've exhausted all of your uh, possibilities to like appeal. Um, appeal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then there was like obviously a constitutional maneuver to say that well, actually, when the Constitution says exhausting all the options of appeal, actually, what they meant just like exhausting some of them. So they did that to uh, put him in prison bef before the elections, right. so he wasn't able to run. After the elections, this pressing urgency of keeping him in jail was kind of gone, so the political settlement allowed him to, to walk out. So um, technically, he's still appealing to the higher instances of justice, but there is this judgment that will decide whether or not the judge that ruled against him was behaving in an adequately impartial way or whether he was uh, being partial, which is uh, what most reasonable people can see, especially after the series of revelations we did at The Intercept, where we had access to messages between the persecution and the judge. So uh, it is expected that they will rule uh, in the near future. And... Uh, while it's not a slam dunk, it, it, it looks like he might be ruled that uh, the judge was not behaving properly against Lula. Wow. Well, so fingers crossed uh, yeah. that he gets even freer, freer. So he's, they have to wait. And so he could go to jail. 
Yeah, I mean, he could go to jail, but it's it's just I don't, too, it's okay. just don't it's think he will go to jail. Yeah. The the question is whether or not he'll he'll have his political rights restored. Yeah, it's very unlikely that he'll actually go to jail again. Right. Okay. So right now he's kind of living like a felon after he serves his time. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a, a great analogy. In America, yeah. Which was um, something that uh, something else to put out there was that this was never a law that you're not allowed to run if you're if you're a convicted person. And then right. during uh, the Workers Party government, a lot of anti-corruption laws were put in place, so that it was the Workers Party put all these anti-corruption laws in place to fight corruption, and then these laws were used against them and no one else. So, you know, just food for thought. Yeah. Well, Victor, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can people find you in your work? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter on that uh, handle you've so kindly put up. Uh, I am on The Intercept. I will be, I put some content in there uh, once in a while, but not very often. My main work now is I produce Glenn Greenwald's uh, show on YouTube, System Update, which so I highly encourage everyone to check out. Uh, we have some really good episodes, not only about Brazil. We have a great episode in uh, about Bolivia. Uh, I did an app. Uh, I filled in for Glenn uh, about Latin America with Benjamin Fogel, which uh, oh, I think great. was good. Uh, we talk about Brazil. We talk about Colombia, and we talk about Mexico. And the whole. Um, I mean, I am a little bit biased, but I think all the episodes of the of Glenn's show are great. You great should watch show, them yeah. all. Great. I got to watch the Sean one because I really like him. Yeah, um, it was good. This seems super well also. The algorithm just loves. Oh, great. Okay, yeah. Them. I got to pick your brain about algorithm stuff. Um, but uh, thank you again so much, Victor. How do I pronounce your last name? Uh, do you want to try and guess first? And I'll see. Ugh, no, Puji. Uh, it is that. Okay. Yeah, the it's not Portuguese, so it's a trick question. Oh, so what like is it? It's supposed to be French. I don't know a French person. Oh, that makes I'm sense. Never sure of that, but the name is meant to be. Nice. Okay, cool. Got a lot right. of good French victors. All right. Thank you, Victor. Say hi Thanks to Glenn you, and the pleasure. dogs and the dogs. Yeah, I will. And the kids. Okay. Hi. Bye. All righty. Are you guys ready to have on our next guest, who we're so excited to have on? By the way, I'm not wearing a robe. I'm wearing a shirt and a scarf. Thanks. Um, thank you. Monday Grock. Wearing a scarf to match your bathroom seems like the kind of thing Pelosi would do. T-shirt, not a robe. Nice try. All right. Without any further ado, ado we're going to bring in our excellent next guest. Uh, you've known him and loved him and laughed at him and maybe laughed till you cried. James Adomian. Hello, James. Hi. Hi, Katie. How are you? Good. You? I'm good. You hear me okay? Yep. Oh, I, I hear it. you well. Um, nice to see you again. Well, this is uh, I saw you earlier this week. Yeah, we're on a podcast circuit uh, crossover right now this week. Yeah, we're like a spousal hire. Like you book one of us, you book the other. You yeah. want me, you got James. You want James, you got me. We're um, just like Carville and Matlin. Oh, my God. We should do. Have you done that? Have you done that? I, uh, James Carville all the time, right? Yeah, I get well, no, I mean, I have a friends who do James Carville, but it's like, but uh, you haven't done that one, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just okay. you just gotta be you make up a folksy saying that no one's ever heard before, like this leg is like a whole, like a this leg is like a bowl of uh, you know, spicy rice. Oh, well, I well, well, half a wheel off. Well, I was in the army, I met him one time, and his breath stank. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like what? What kind of stench are we talking? Uh, yeah, like he was <laughs> like a like an old possum underneath a crawl space. <laughs> like a lot, like a lobster left running in the river. Like George Bush <laughs> promised not to raise taxes. <laughs> you know, it smells like the economy. Stupid. <laughs> it smells like a, a hundred dollar bill dragged through a trailer park, <laughs> as he famously what? said. What? Luckily, I keep a spare set of feathers for just, I say, for just such an emergency. Oh, what a terrible person he is, huh? Yeah, yeah. But more importantly, you, his breath stinks. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's cold here. It's turning into fall up here in the Northeast. Um, oh, it's so hot here. I'm in Los Angeles. It's right. So How are hot. you? What's it like? I don't really have a sense of like, when you look out the window, is it just fire? What's What's happening? 
They're doing controlled fires these days uh, to prevent the out of control fires. So this either so the sky is full of smoke, but it's it's good smoke this time. Okay, it's like a little. And they they basically they surround an area with fire retardant, and then they light it on fire so that it won't catch fire later. Um, got so it. That's, what, that's what we got. It's hot. It's in the nineties today. It's uh, still hot tonight, but uh, better hot than cold, I say. So it's almost like a vaccine. <laughs> that's how right? it backfired. That, yeah, it's like a vaccine uh, that just puts a lot of smoke in the air. Yeah. It's the uh, hydroxychloroquine of firefighting. So I got to ask, what do you feel? What are your thoughts on now? And I, I want to make sure that people know James is going to talk about something really important. So yes, uh, coming up, we're going to talk about up. several things. We're going to talk things, about what's yeah. happening in Armenia, how you can help the people of Armenia. Um, but obviously there's lighter news. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll eat. It's probably, but let's start with lighter news, right? Because you want to do that. It's awkward to be like. The president is in the hospital. (laughs) The lighter news. The president is in the hospital. Now do your best, Mary Matlin. Oh my God. I don't even. What? what, what, what? You know what's interesting about them? The older they get, the more they look alike. The Mary Matlin is. I agree with my husband. Is she Southern, though? No, she's not. Okay. I don't know what she sounds like. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's been it's been a eventful week. Actually, I can't believe that the debates were also this week. I know it, it feels like it was like a week ago. Yeah, I know it does feel like it's a week ago, and it's funny. It's like I can't even put out. I'm like, I, we did that debate. We did that podcast with um, Bad Faith podcast with Virgil and and Bree, and mm-hmm. it kind of feels like I can't even like. I mean, and we and we released the. Um, the uh our, our useful idiots episode on it and it just feels like it's like so last week like yeah. so five weeks ago or something it, even though it's three days it ago it feels like it feels like last chapter because since then yeah since then the there was a whole round of like finger pointing about the debate which i thought biden clearly lost and then there was the big un like unbelievable shoe that dropped of Donald Trump testing positive coronavirus after shaming Joe Biden for not wearing a mask uh, for, for wearing, wearing a mask yeah. for wearing a mask right after um it's after true. basically basically like Icarus flying too close to the sun here he is the definition of hubris yeah now That's he has true. it and then and then now 24 hours later not only does not less than 24 hours like 20 hours later not only is okay he has coronavirus all day <laughs> But now he's rapidly developing symptoms. They've rushed him to the hospital. There's rumors that he's on a respirator. Like, good God. And apparently his brother died of coronavirus earlier in the summer. Yeah, but they they didn't say it was coronavirus. I think they pretended it was cancer, right? Right, right, right. I, you, oh, God. Wow. Yeah. And, and, there's, and um, there's several other people in the White House. There's Hope Hicks. There's, like, several people around the president. Right. And, like, they, it's... I this um, it has the makings of like a biblical like, morality play, where it's <laughs> they, they didn't yeah. they didn't believe in the thing, right? And then they all got the thing, right? Yeah, I mean, we were just talking with Victor, who's uh, you know, and Bolsonaro, of course, got it, and he managed to use that to his advantage, which Trump will definitely do if he if he survives and does well, yeah, let's keep in mind, he's very rich. He has, yes. uh, he has not only the best medical care, but like the top medical care in the world. Right. Um, now he's an arrogant bastard. So maybe he's demanding experimental therapies. You right. give me the best guy. Go- you give me the best goddamn treatment. That's the best treatment. Give me, I want to be pumped full of vitamin D. I want to be a balloon of vitamin D. Uh, I want to look like a vitamin D balloon from the World's Fair in 1898. Um, But he he might yell at his doctors and demand stuff that's actually going to be worse for him. Who knows? Uh, Or if he believes in all, if he, how many kooky therapies does he believe in that he's going to be like, give it to me? I kind of think he'll just find, try to find the smartest doctor, be like the best of the best of the best, top, 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 as he described. uh, uh Amy uh Coney Barrett uh her name is Amy right I was I always want to call her something else I can't handle the three names 
I it's don't just know. Too much. I, 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 her name to me is like the Scalia two or something. Yeah, Scalia. What, what was the name of that original Trump doctor? I think he doesn't work for him oh. anymore. The one who said he wasn't obese. Um, the guy who looks kind of like Jesse Ventura playing a doctor. Kind of. I had said. I had said that he looked like uh, the Pete Best of the Moody Blues. Oh yeah. He's got that long gray hair yeah. and like a black turtleneck. So he looked like <laughs> the guy that didn't make it into the Moody Blues. Yes. He also looked a lot. He kind of looked like um what do you say not obese? That was it, right? He kind of looked like there was a doctor on one of the seasons, I think the second season of True Detective. Sounds right. Yeah. That show had some good political statements. Uh um, yeah, about but that, neoliberalism. Uh, uh the first I season i didn't see it i need to it takes place in my oh my the second area. season yeah it takes place in, in that area um well if anyone puts a link to the doctor we can look at his face because i forgot what he looked like but remember when nancy pelosi called him morbidly obese it totally backfired of course because the dems don't know how to actually like attack trump effectively and uh and then of course she got like woke criticism for fat shaming yes Yes, uh, probably, and, and but nobody nobody stops to go. Hmm. Nancy Pelosi will actually take damage hits from woke criticism. Donald Trump will not. Oh, it, I mean, exactly. But what's so brilliant about it is that not only that, but Trump, who like you know accused Megyn Kelly of leading out of her, I don't know what's right, I don't know where, is like so vulgar. He gets people to defend him using the woke thing. So when your fellow country woman, Anna Kasparian called Alex Jones a, f a fat fuck, it wasn't planned. It was like, he was just got on, he like, you know, stormed the stage that they were on at the DNC. I think that's, pretty, that's yeah, it's a pretty, uh, uh, scientific description <gasps> of Alex Jones. I mean, yeah. And people how dare were like, you? how dare you I'm not a fat fuck. He called Hillary I'm a heroic patriotic fuck. He called Hillary Clinton a goblin to my face on video. Right. I was like, "What? Do you, what? What don't you like about?" Were about you interviewing it? Alex Jones? Too? I ran into him the day that that happened. Where was it? It was in Cleveland, and there were they were. He stormed the set, um, and of of the Young Turks. He stormed the set. He wouldn't leave, and it was like I have to say, it provoked a very funny kind of chain reaction. So so Anna is like, "Get get the fuck out, you fat fuck." And Jimmy Dore spat iced tea in his face. And gotta love Jimmy. Cenk, known him for a long time. It's a, yeah, it's a great. <laughs> it was so funny. He just it's just like pure like slapstick comedy right there. And Jenk is like, we talk about Saudi Arabia all the time. I don't even remember why he said that. It was somehow relevant. Um, this, sounds, this sounds like a circus. I would have liked to have tickets for. Well, um, you know, yeah. It was, uh, and then I'm walking down the street and I ran into him and I'm wearing like a sundress because I'm at the RNC. Did and he, did he attack you verbally or he nope. didn't know who you were? No, I'll show you. You want to see? I'll show you. Let's see. I filmed it from my We know who you are, Katie Halper. We know what you're useful idiot. Hold on. I got to show you. Is this from my perspective? We know that we know that you do. A, we know that you, you, you're proudly do work with a known slinger of rock and roll excess. Matt Taibbi, the Rolling Stone. It's his got a lot more views when he did it on um, on Infowars. But let me just show you this because I don't know where that thing is right now. And they call me like a liberal reporter, I think. Hold on. If only they knew. You're neither liberal nor a reporter, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty on Wrong point. on both counts, Alex. All right. You're you're a you're a you're one of these you're one of these liberal woke class conscious communist socialist libertarians out there. Globalist. Globalist, and also you're and you're a Nazi. Right, globalist Nazi. I, <laughs> I, I love, love that thing, that yeah, combo. I, when people can't uh, see, I'm being very careful. Coronavirus. The president can get it. I'm washing my hands. I'm 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 cleaning my hands even at home. Yeah, because I could get it to you. Oh, this is your uh, this yeah. is your run in here. Ready? Yeah, I want to see this. Yeah. We need our, our uh, one of the security guys has all the keys. Roger Stone. I will. I'll be back. I'll be There's back. Roger Stone with his radio. back in? Sure. Okay, yeah, he was good. Okay, there I am coming around the corner. Sure. Are you enjoying yourself? 
I, I like standing up against tyranny, yeah. Where do you think the biggest threat of tyranny is coming from? From the globalists that are running our government in the ground. And the government running our government in the ground. Well, there's no choice. Trump's all the way. Trump's, a, witch. Trump's She's a patriot. A She's a Jezebel. Look at his yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. shirt. Okay. And any reservations about Trump? Yeah, I don't like some of the torture stuff, but at least he's honest about it. Hillary's I saw about this. I saw this. Oh, okay. I don't what like is, some of the torture stuff. Mean, I mean, she just wants to piss all over the country and dominate everything like a big fat goblin. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he got you. And any other messages for people? Who... <laughs> well, we're standing up, so the, the, the things are laying down are over, so get ready for a fight. I'm going to fight. You better believe you got one. Thank you. You know what's funny? What? What's funny is that A, oh, there's so many. Okay, that, this, this is great. This, first of all, in his belief, a big fat goblin is just always pissing and dominating. <laughs> yeah. uh, or you could say people that piss and dominate are just big fat goblins. Like either way, like <laughs> it's, right. such a, it's such a great choice of words. I know. Is, and that, from, think, is, is that, from, that from Tolkien? Where did he get Yeah. That? And well, do you think he literally, like, is that a conspiracy? Like, does he actually think Hillary's a goblin? Like, is that a conspiracy he would wield? Some of them do. I'm not a fan of Hillary Clinton, but I do believe that biologically she's, she's human. Homo sapiens. Yes, yeah, she's Homo sapiens. Yeah. And I, I mean, it seems that way about Alex Jones too. But ironically, yeah. if there's a guy that looks like a goblin out of a fairy tale, you know, like with yes. yes. you like stewed everything he said, yeah. every every utterance out of his mouth is hateful. Yeah. I'm gonna go with guttural fire. Yeah, you can imagine like some sounds like I'm torturing myself. You I could, live in a world of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, what it's so great because he's like, he's so quick. I think we maybe talked about this on, on Useful Idiots because one of the things I like so much about him is how good he is at, at small talk. Because I'm like, hi, how are you doing? He's like, I'm doing good. I always enjoy. I'm like, are you are you having a good time? He's like, yeah, I'm enjoying myself. I always enjoy defeating tyranny. Yeah. I always enjoy defeating tyranny. He doesn't have fun. He's always on message. There's no like, there's no like off camera version of alex jones who's like it's a good day i was thinking right. about maybe getting a massage watching a movie later taking it's a break from just... this fighting tyranny i mean J james would you ha be in a good mood if you spent all your time fighting tyranny and uh, and do goblin identifying goblin calling out well I would, out least, goblins, I would at least want to play i would want to play some drinking games or like chit chat with people over coffee once in a while right yeah you know you have some small talk <laughs> Beat around the bush a little bit. Yeah. Well, you're talking about beat around the bush. That's exactly what happened on the morning of September 11th. <laughs> this country was beating around the bush. We've got evidence. We've got evidence. We'll have uh, David Icke is on in the next hour. Do you remember also, when he talked his, about, yeah, like Jews, like a bunch of people looking like Seinfeld or something? What was that? It was so funny. I couldn't find that. I was looking for it the other day. For years and years and years, Alex Jones tried to tiptoe and pretend that he was, he tried he tried really hard to not be publicly anti-Semitic. Right. And then at some point he just dropped it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then he was, he was talking about people, you know, the media having too many people who looked like Seinfeld, or yeah. something, which is like, okay, that's, you did it. You went there. I think he pretended KKK people were Jews. Wasn't that it? He's like, you get off their hood and, and you're going to find some Seinfeld actors there. Bunch of bunch of extras. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. The uh uh the um if you have decided, if you have decided that um the bad guy if you decided that you're the good guy, then the people that are like on your side, you have to come up with a theory that they're that they're really infiltrators pretending to be that they that there's like a Scooby Doo reveal where they pull a thing off and they're the other side. Right. Remember when 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 Obama replaced Bush in the White House in two thousand nine? I remember Alex Jones had a whole video on his website that was like uh, Obama taking a mask off, revealing that Bush was underneath. Like that was the preview for this like expose that as right. if to say the Obama administration is just Bush right. under a new face. Right. And it's like, well, you're like, you're not wrong, Alex. There's some things that <laughs> there's some agreement between the administration. Right. And there's probably some Machiavellian handshakes about right not prosecuting war crimes but there is some distance between their position on many major issues yeah right i know it is funny how they're they're that whole like woke uh overlap in certain things uh i that, think like, I, yeah. I think alex jones really believes that it's <laughs> 
at some like, point, American history will be solved by a Scooby Doo reveal where someone pulls a mask off of someone. And they go, I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids. Yeah, we should. You should do that. You should make a. Oh, I forgot. We like live in COVID. You can't really make videos the way we used to. Yeah, we do it like this. We basically, we basically, we're giving away the writers' room. Yeah, all, all it is is ideas. This, but I found that thing by the way of Alex Jones. I'm oh boy! Yeah, I this love that we're in. I love that we're in this world. Okay, all right. This is this is good. Also, is his voice is that kind of voice that. This always has heartburn. Just con <laughs> constant indigestion. Or he's just eating nothing but a, a, just any barbecue pork, barbecue beef. I'm on, I'm on a limited vegetable diet. <laughs> the manhood. Saute it in his own gastric juices. Yeah, you're going to saute it. Pull it back up. Some of that, you want a really tangy barbecue sauce with a little bit of your you know stomach acids. <laughs> you could. He should sell that. Oh, God. There's so much cussing, I can't play it. Here's a little bit of audio. Can you of hear me, it? Like 18 years yeah. ago, protesting the KKK. There's no big crowd of Antifa there supporting there me. There he is. And then threatening to kill me, everything else. Because Young Alex Jones. And it later came out that they were federal agents, like I said. It wasn't even real. I mean, quite frankly, I've been to these events. A lot of the KKK guys with their hats off look like they're from the cast of Seinfeld. Literally, they're just Jewish actors. Nothing against Jews in general, but the leftist Jews want to, you know, create this clash and they go dress up as Nazis. That footage in Austin, we're going to find it somewhere here at the office where it literally looks like the cast of Seinfeld or like Howard Stern in a Nazi outfit. They all look like Howard Stern. He won't. Uh, he doesn't understand. Curly hair down, if, and they're just up there hiling Hitler. You tell they're totally uncomfortable. They're totally scared. And it's all just meant to create the clash. Please help us to understand what transpired that fateful day. I love the idea. They're totally uncomfortable. They're totally afraid. Obviously, they're Jews in KKK face. Yeah. This is what happens when someone's like a self taught, like a capable, talented, self taught person is that there's no external, like, uh, tent poles or guideposts right. that they can, where they can see, oh, my barrel is my, the barrel that I'm floating in is going over the side of the waterfall. Like, they, they're, they believe that they're always right. And right. any conclusion that their mind comes to is correct. Yeah. So, so if the external guideposts that say you, you are wrong or right. your reasoning is flawed or you, you, you have a paranoia problem, some kind right. of mental illness, they, they don't, it's just, I'm right. No, I'm right. I'm always right. They've decided yeah. a priori that they're correct. Right. A priori correctness. Yeah. Yep. It's all, it's really amazing. Um, and what about, uh, any, any insights into, I don't know what's happening now, Trump, uh, how, uh, well, I thought that it looked like the election was, uh, very like scarily close, scarily close. And I, we, uh, the, the Atlantic article that came out last week about how there was a real risk of, um, you know, violence that it's not a matter of, oh, Trump could refuse to recognize the results of the election, but that they, that the Republican strategy is to deny legitimate results of the election in certain states. Right. Uh, pr provoke violence and then uh, declare martial law in certain states where a Republican le legislature could then say, well, we couldn't do the vote. So here's the electors that are going to decide the presidency. And that there's key choke points, including the United States Senate, where Mike Pence holds the gavel as the vice president. And obviously the Supreme Court is a tied Supreme Court now, uh, four to four. And that if the seat is filled, it would be five to four, well, depending on how some of the Republican appointees would come down on various rulings. But uh, so it looked like, you know, even if Biden won, that they might claw it back away from him, that it could be all kinds of things that were pointing towards while there could be a lot of confusion and as reluctant as we are to imagine it, there could be political violence with a, a unclear presidential election that, that, that is not really decided until January or not decided at all. But then, and then the debate, the debate, the debate made me more scared because I thought Biden pretty conclusively lost the debate, um, getting interrupted and in, by Trump so much and not having an effective response and then this news kind of upends everything. It was it's just such an uh, incredible surprise happened in uh, 
an election year. Maybe it shouldn't be such a surprise since there is a very contagious, very deadly pandemic that the president and his ideological bubble have been flaunting the dangers of uh, right. as a way of, as a way of proving their toughness. Uh, and also as a way of trying, you know, there, the news about how Biden didn't have a very strong ground game in the campaign, but Trump did. And part of that was that they have an advantage that in some ways they believe in the dangers of coronavirus less. Right. And now it looks like possibly, possibly some major blowback for them politically to say nothing of the health of the people involved, uh, but possibly historic consequences from this hubris and uh, arrogance in the face of real um, pandemic danger. There's also a possibility that Trump, being the president of the United States, could get world-class health care and beat coronavirus like Bolsonaro. Right. Uh, and maybe <laughs> maybe give it to a bunch of other people, but still be okay himself. And then who knows? There could be a comeback narrative. There's just enough time for that, too. I mean, I think if he beats it and is in an okay shape, he will get, he will get a boon from this. Because... <sighs> I, I think he will because he is so adept. Actually, Victor said this. Um, what was it? Um, Biden never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Trump and or Biden? No, Biden. Biden never, never misses miss. an opportunity to <laughs> miss an opportunity. True. That's true. And, and Trump makes opportunities out of everything and anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw that the, the Democrats are pulling off all their negative ads right yes, now. Yes. Which... And I'm like, I could see maybe, maybe maybe pulling back the negative ads that are like Donald if you name him but you should replace them with different negative ads that are like the republicans have ruined right. the country yeah also you don't have to have it like obviously they weren't like this like we hope he gets covid and die well they, of course they weren't saying that well, but, well, I, want, I want he's gonna what, what would they say how would alex jones say it a, a plague i, I hope he gets a plague yeah, the plane. remember in the Democratic primary debates, uh, either late last year, yeah, it would have been late last year. There was an ad on one of the networks that ran the Democratic debate with Bernie and Biden and Warren and Kamala Harris and all the other candidates and the CIA rat that stole Iowa. Um, there was an ad that the Republican Party, I think, or maybe some super PAC ran an ad that was like socialism is plaguing America. And they had a picture of AOC that lit on fire from the center in the middle of this ad. They, the, the right wing has no problem right. celebrate celebrating someone's death or calling for political violence. The left is always expected to play by different rules. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And not even right. just the left, but like the centrists that occupy the democratic party. Right, right. The people who pretend to... I mean, they're just a bunch of, bunch of centrists trying to pre pretend to me. Love this. Centrist, liberal, moderate, progressive, socialist, communist. Bunch Democrats. of... It's like the Seinfeld actors under the KKK hoods. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, but I think he will if he, if he... I mean, the irony is like Walter Reed is a military hospital, right? And it's like the best of the best. It's socialism. It's socialized medicine. Yeah, uh, for army, someone yeah. for someone who screams as much as he does about socialism, Donald Trump has gotten his whole life uh, a lot of free shit out of a government that he didn't pay much into. Right. And someone was posting on Twitter today that uh, Donald Trump is about to get tens of thousands of dollars in free medical care, having only paid seven hundred fifty dollars into the system. So crazy, yeah. So what if you were if you were Bush uh, if you were Bernie right now? What would what would Bernie be saying? Well, I'm already said this, so I'm too nice. I am nice to a f to a flaw. I am merciful to my enemies to a fault. And so I would say this is a time for us to come together and have a very serious discussion about the issues that face us, a pandemic crisis, and how the fantastic government health care that Donald Trump is about to get is the health care that should be available to Americans, whether they are the, you know, the president of the United States or not. And what would he tell Biden? Do you think he'd have any tips for Biden? Uh, look, Joe, you're my friend. I understand you stole the election from me. I will. I am absolutely letting that go. And what I would give you, I would give you half an hour of advice that I understand you will ignore. And I will still vote for you because I am not ruthless enough, even though I am almost always right. 
That's I like that. <laughs> I see. I get to say things as Bernie that I want him to say. Right. That you want Bernie to say. Yeah. But if, what if you could control Bernie? What would Bernie like? Let's say Bernie didn't have his political the political commitments that he has and was like more of a revolutionary. What what would what would that like, Bernie sound like, like? Starting from today. Yeah, let's say he wakes up and he's like, forget it. We got one guy with COVID. The other guy lets himself get punched in the face by what if Bernie could get angry because he was basically throwing Bernie on the bus. So what yeah. would like? Yeah, what I Bernie? would say is what I would say is in this unprecedented time, in order to avoid a civil war in the United States, we should all come together and vote for Joe Biden. And then the day after the election on November 3rd, I believe it's November 3rd, we must come to the realization that the Democratic Party cannot be the home for the progressive movement, for future generations, for justice in America, and we must inaugurate a new second party in this country. <laughs> Not a third party, a second party. Get rid of Unbelievable them. that the Democrats survived the Civil War to begin with the last time in the 1860s, being on the wrong side of that war. But uh, but now, yeah, we're done. We're done with the Democrats. One more time, one more time, as a favor. One more time we do this whole thing. Yeah, one more time we'll do the Biden thing, and that's it. That's it. From now on, no more Democrats. I love the way you get the, yeah, the I can't do it, because I do too much of near Yeah, this, the almost not even full yeah. It's like, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah I love, uh, Bernie reminds me of a lot of beloved professors yeah well oh, do you remember that guy rick wilson that terrible guy who's like oh, bernie Bur you know lincoln project guy yes um a lot of those guys like rick wilson and earlier this week i guess you guys were complaining about somebody else from that whole sort of david brock world of uh online paid trolls and stuff yeah the whole the the hate bernie people yeah i i, I blocked so many of them years ago yeah. that i just don't see large swaths of right so what did he say well no he but he's a guy who was like a i mean he was he unlike brock he's a he's a republican he's like uh -huh. a you know rehabilitated brock used to be a republican right no right brock like cosplays as a i mean i think he has no soul I, either he has no soul or he realized that like maybe he came out to himself or did I don't know if he when he was out when he came out, but I th is, is David Brock gay? Oh yeah. Oh, that's I don't need him on my team. I know, I know. Thank God it's not Jewish. So that's all. None, none of that falls on me. <laughs> um, but uh, I wonder if he was just realized like these people really don't like officially don't like me. So right, if they said one one too many comments at yeah. some cocktail party and then he right. flipped over it. He's like, he's like, I'll flip sides. I'll become a Clinton Democrat. So basically I accomplish the same thing politically, but I get to have those guys as my enemies now. Exactly. And I get to have like better conversations about film and brunch. <laughs> Oscar time is more. Yeah. That's basically, you know. Um, so, okay. So I think, yeah, I, I'm just saying, I don't think we should underestimate Trump's ability to, and if he does this, if he does survive, he'll just say, look, I said this. If you're not vulnerable or, or, you know, or very old, if you're in good health, and I think obviously the results speak for themselves, I'm in good health. And so I'm in good health. To... I'm in fantastic. I'm in the best health. Unbelievable health. And I'm, I'm, I look 10 years younger. I look 10 years younger than I'm I am. I look like I'm 35. <laughs> it's amazing. So you guys on, I, you probably know that James um, and Anthony did Trump versus Bernie. Anthony and Sam and Nick and I did Trump versus Bernie for like five years from 2015 to February of this year was our last tour dates in the Jesus. Northeast, went through New York and Connecticut and everywhere. And I remember like the, the coronavirus news started to hit as we were wrapping our tour up and we started, you know, joking about it when we were on the airplane or driving around together and stuff. And then like, I remember leaving New York city, flying back to LA and like the news was getting worse and worse every day. And I'm like, well, Maybe I won't be seeing New York for a while. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to go. I thought it was going to pass. I mean, I just wasn't paying attention. I just thought yeah. it was a thing that was going to. It has been uh, fucking uh, the worst year of my life. I'm 40. I'm 40 this year. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> When's your birthday? January 31st. So uh, this was my big 4-0 and I've been, um, 
you know how people are always like, huh, oh, this is 40. And so right. like, I always thought, you know, like you get to be 40 and you're like, oh, welcome to like maturity. Right. Oh, 40, you ready to be 40? And I'm, now I'm like, okay. So you turn 40 and then there's a global pandemic. Right. I've like folded all this into what's just normal. When right, right. 40. What's going to happen at 50? Hello. <laughs> ah, that's World the end. Really explodes. Yeah. Um, oh, what I was saying that Rick Wilson, going back to how Bernie sounds like your college professor. Yes. But Rick Wilson is such a dumb fuck that he said, um, what did he say? He's like, you know, Bernie, he's like one of your, you know, typical, he's like crazy socialists, like, you know, Bennington college professors, like Bennington. No, Bernie's like a CUNY, like city university of New York, yes. not like a fancy private, like, I guess it's cause it's in Vermont. But yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, congratulations on trashing a small liberal arts college yeah. like Bennington for no reason. Yeah. You know, Bernie's like a guy who's like, uh, yeah, he's he, he teaching at, at CUNY or like uh, Cal State Northridge yeah. or Santa Monica College, being like, I turned down a lot of more lucrative professorships because I like to speak to the students that need to hear what I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> the one's not born with the silver spoon in the mouth, silver foot in the mouth. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, Bernie has done a lot of great for this country. He has, yeah. I, he's kind of being held hostage right now. But yeah. I really, I really do truly think that the movement for a People's Party is a very good thing that yeah. Nina Turner is involved in. Yeah. And um, we had Chris Hedges on this week. Yes, a lot of great people like Chris Hedges as well. I think there should be a new party, and uh, I think it's not going to be the Greens because they are just. The Greens don't like winning. The Greens, yeah, they don't like winning, and the they Greens, have a public access aesthetic. Yeah, it's it's just, it's, it's, I, I don't care how right you are. I care like there's a combination. There's a graph of like how right you are and how much you can win. Yeah, and yeah, uh, and it's not like you sell. I don't mean like sell out to win. I mean like be mean and ruthless and right. do certain things to win. Yes, they don't have any of that. Is a, but yeah, there should be a new party with this explicit goal of replacing the Democratic and or Republican Party as the as like the biggest party in the country, because the country has like a far more right wing government. And that includes the Republicans and the centrist Democrats. Like right. the, the country's politics is way more right wing and uh, in service of the wealthy elite than the population is. Right. Um, there's a, that infamous Princeton study that came out a couple years ago that concluded that the United States was an oligarchy because, right. because uh, issue after issue, what the people want is not represented as even an option between the positions of the major political parties. So it's just a controlled political process. It's a fake political process. It's a, it's a fake democracy. You know, like they said in Spain when they were having their protests a few years ago, uh, D Democracia falsa, uh, falsa, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's it's time to come to an end, and uh, we got to move on to something better that represents like the potential of this country and solve some of the problems, stop making things worse. And uh, I think the, the good news is the centrists and moderates they could still steal an election for in their own party and stuff, but they've totally lost like two entire generations now. They've totally they've totally aggressively lost the millennials completely and the the generation z after them they've totally absolutely lost them uh they've offered they've offered them nothing but condescension and i, I, I yeah sure vote for biden if you want to uh it's important to stop trump but after this i'm no done more. i'm done fuck the whole thing it, it, no no more of the ransoming like you have to. No, sorry. This time we're going to have four whole years before the next presidential election. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play the game again. Yeah. We should sign. We should start signing people. We should draft people away from the Democratic Party. I'm not even kidding. I think I think probably for... We should so that then we can say to the people there, what are you doing? Why are you standing in the way of this? We're trying to defeat the Republican. I, I think that's or... one of the things they want to do. They want to get some of the progressive members right. of Congress to leave the Democratic Party. But I think out of decorum and maybe keeping up appearances, they're going to wait until after the election to do yeah. it. No, yeah, no, yeah. Speaking of which, someone you know very well as a character is part spoke at that people's convention. Jesse. Oh, <laughs> Oh, I don't know if it was because of me, but I did suggest that they get him. 
he, he, that word might have, they might have talked to each other independently of that. But uh, yes, I loved seeing, he was a late announcement too. Well, what, what, how did he decide? What, yeah. what do you think he said to himself? Well, I was Our down, defense. I was on a surfboard. I was out at sea in Mexico. I was on a surfboard looking out at the sunset. And I, you know, I, there had been a riptide and I was carried out far into the current. It was not a normal surf set. I was being, I was being pulled out to the open sea on my surfboard. And I was just sitting there contemplating the sunset as I was swept away towards Easter Island. And I, I sat there in my wetsuit billowing out of it in certain places. And I said, I said, you know, I'm not going to run for president, but I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm a third party guy, whether it's reform or the independence party of Minnesota or, or the greens. I vote greens nowadays. I eat, I eat greens, I eat broccoli and I vote greens. I vote Jill Stein. And then I said, well, maybe it's time to see, maybe it's time to get back to Nina Turner after all. Maybe it's time to come. I know Dr. Cornell West had sent me a, he sent me a little um, RSVP <laughs> self-addressed stamped envelope. He sent me a SACE. <laughs> and so I, uh, maybe out, and then I gave me the inspiration. I paddled back in, <laughs> paddled back in. I caught an ocean, ocean current. I got a ride on one of the little barges and I went back to my compound in Cab de Cabo. <laughs> Oh, I forgot and he I, lives in I Cabo, off, Mexico. And I, am, yeah. I immediately, I immediately sent off a telegram to Minnesota <laughs> saying, "I'll do it, I'll do it." Have you ever met him? No, I've talked to him online. He's like hard to meet because he's uh, very private about about his location. Right, he there has was, to be. He can't do it at all. There was a moment for like a couple months where we were trying to do something together. I had invited him on something and then he had counter invited me on one of his shows and then it didn't work for a couple reasons. And then there was, we were going to do it. And he was like, I'm going to be in LA short notice. And I was like, great. And then like two days before, I'm not kidding you. His studio flood flooded. And he was like, can't do it. The studio <laughs> flooded. What studio where in Mexico or no? It was, it was like a temporary studio that he was going to use in LA, and like the sprinklers had gone off overnight and like ruined the studio or something. What was it? Um, psyops, you think? I the, the thought, Look, the thoughts definitely that's obviously the most likely thing. <laughs> Cointel Pro, <laughs> I don't use a Coinstar machine, I use a Cointel Pro machine. <laughs> Have you uh, ever met people who have been like offended by your impersonations? Yeah, sure. Uh, sometimes people are a big fan of somebody and they're like, why are you making fun of them? And I'm like, I am making fun of them to celebrate them. I right. mean, that's, that's the way like the rough world works where you roast somebody you love. Right. I and mean, then, probably not in the case of Gorka or, or Lieberman, right? Yeah, sometimes, or George W. Bush. Sometimes oh, yeah. I am kind of really giving it to him pretty hard. and But you can tell. You can right. tell when you watch someone's impression. Like, are you drawing blood? Are you really right. going for the jugular? Or are you kind of making them look good? But when I say you can tell, not 100% of people can tell. So uh, some uh, sometimes sometimes you lose... You lose a few people when you're too ironic or even just an appropriate amount of irony is always going to lose somebody. Right. Um, um, and I, always what shoot, I always shoot for 90%. <laughs> if 90% okay. of people are having a great time, that's that's about as good as it's going to be. There's always 10% right. of people who are like, well, I don't know if I like that. Right. Uh, let's see. I, uh, your Bush is great. That's how we met. We met when you were doing Bush. We met back in the... Uh, in the two, in the aughts, in the aughts, yeah, in the two thousands, uh, for laughing liberally, and you were doing stand up, and I was doing. Um, am I? Do I gotta adjust something? Your mic a little bit. They want more of you. Did I go quiet, or have I always been? No, quiet? I think, and who knows if that's true? But someone asked if I could. I don't control it, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the problem is, if I turn it up, it's louder in my headphones. Um. Oh, okay. It's fine. It's fine with me. Yeah, we'll turn it up right. later. Yeah. Okay, we'll turn it up late. We'll turn it up in post. But uh, you were doing stand up, and this is how how I met. Like, yeah, Baratunde and uh, yeah. maybe Justin Krebs. What? 
I knew Mark Marin already, but like right, we all did a show together. This yeah, is back when I wasn't Mark, like Mark. Mark was there. Like yeah. this is like political Mark Marin, who is like right. yeah, it's like Bush. Can you believe his shit? Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah, it's fucked. It's fucked up, man. Um. But yeah, I was doing George Bush in those days. And it was like, uh, that was, I would take questions from the audience. It was so good. That was, that's when I always say this about you. Like I'm your, like your proud mom or something, but like, you're so good. Oh, Kate says something nice. Uh, love you, Katie and James. Check out people for Jesse on Twitter. We will. We'll do that. Um, <laughs> we're real. And you can vote for him. Thank you, Neil Finnegan. And uh, imitations is a serious form of flattery. Yes. Except not when you're, when you're talking about Bush, but. Um, do you do Chomsky? Chomsky is right down. If you, if there was like a, if there was like a, a, um, what do you call it? A speedometer of, but going, going from, um, how, what, what does it look like on the screen? Uh, going from like, from like completely boring to like very interesting. Yeah. Chomsky is down there riding the zero point at completely boring. Like, oh Yeah. I mean that that would have to become the joke. Like Phil Hartman's right. Phil Hartman did a very funny Larry King impression on the Dana Carvey show back in the nineties, I guess. Wow. It was a very relative to other Larry King impressions, very, very extremely dry Larry King, which was hilarious because how else would you gonna contrast with Dana right. Carvey doing Ross Perot? Right. So I remember Phil Hendry's um impression of Larry King was like was you know like a balanced budget where do you come down on the show? <laughs> right so i mean if you were gonna do chomsky yeah i mean sure you could probably do it if someone was gonna pay me for it i'd, I'd, right. I'd watch the videos and come up with it but, but isn't, yeah. i don't know if there's much to take to my audience do you think he would like i wonder if he were less boring if we'd have like worldwide revolution by now I don't know. Uh, he, he, he's, nobody's perfect. No, he's um, perfect. Yeah. He, the, the, I mean, his voice. That's all I mean. His books are great. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine a really charismatic Chomsky. Someone has to. Someone has to just read Chomsky on tape as a very well, charismatic. Well, you're basically person. describing Eddie Pepitone. Oh yeah, you're right. I read Chomsky. Manufacturing consent. The working class is told in their minds that they should consent to things that they don't want to. Anyone is there anyone else? Corporate you've, media. Corporate media said. What about um I how about Lieberman? Can you just say uh oh your McCain is so good? All right, real quick, both of those guys. All right, and a, then we'll you, get to you know all these you know these all all these old impressions I used to do. Katie knows the time the time machine impressions yeah. that I used to do 15 years ago. And, Joseph Lieberman is it's the uh, we stand shoulder to shoulder. With the right wing uh, police state militarism of our opponents in the Republican Party, we stand shoulder to shoulder. Um, I'm proud to be a Democrat that never does anything liberal. Um, and then what was it? Uh, oh, my, oh, yeah, McCain. Um, oh, God, uh, that was good. It's been a while. It's been a while. Is it? It's, I, I'm declaring it not too soon anymore. Yeah. Um, well, it's I do. We did McCain. I did so McCain. Good. I remember when we did McCain. We he were the, when he ran. We were there. I video you from the night that he lost. You took to the Obama. video, yeah. and I would. I had. I recruited Drew Drogi to play Cindy McCain. I don't know if he was at that show. I don't know if he would fly to New York with me back mm -mm. in those days. But Drew Drogi played Cindy McCain, and I played John McCain. And we would go around like a, we would like snipe at each other and get in fights at these. We would pretend that we were doing a campaign rally and be like, don't touch me, you fucking bitch. That was yeah, that was fun because I, I saw John McCain one time. I went and sat in the Senate gallery as like a tourist and saw him. And like, I've never seen some someone who, you know, they have their camera, their camera reality, which is like they know they're always in frame right. kind of here. And below that. He was, it was, you tense with rage. Wow. He was like, this bill is a disgrace. <laughs> this bill is an outrage. I served with people. And it was like, good God. Wait, where did you see him? Sorry. You're you saw never not, I, in the Senate, just sitting in the Senate. I was in the gallery. Oh, wow. And what I brought saw, you I, there? I saw the part of McCain that you don't see like on right. camera. Where it was like, he was just veins bulging, angry all the time. 
you know, a rage farmer. Right. He, you know, if he if he hadn't been a busy elected official, he would have fit on on Twitter very well. Right. Yeah. Or maybe mass murder type of guy. He would have been. I feel like he was a little too old to become like a Columbine shooter, but. Well, he uh. He got that out of his system. He was enough of. I went. I'm a maverick. I'm a maverick. I disagree with some of my Republican friends on a few cosmetic things. And when you when you're a Republican that minimally disagrees with your own party on a couple of things, the Democrats will throw a parade for you. They'll throw a parade and take you out to steak dinner. Oh, and he refuses to not use that word. Oh, lots of oh god, yes. Lots of those words. He was a rough guy. He was a yeah. rough guy. He was definitely an iconic figure of my young adulthood, though, in politics. Yeah. He was just kind of always around. Um, bomb, yes. bomb, 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 bomb around. <laughs> Remember that? Bomb, bomb, bomb. I do. I do. I do. I, God, I remember I did, I did like a two McCain's cartoon for, during the campaign that was like a good one and an evil one on, on his two different shoulders. <laughs> like the old car, the old Tex Avery cartoon trope. And it was just him, though? Both of them? Yeah, well, it was like an angry McCain and a, like, try to get along McCain. God, yeah. remember those days when that was the bad guy? Boy, oh boy. McCain, yeah. Wow, well, quaint. Remember how quaint some, quaint. someone called Obama an Arab? He's like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. He's an American. He's an American citizen. No, ma'am. What you're supposed to call American. him is that one. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I he did do that one. Yeah. yeah, that one all. That one all. You're so <laughs> remember the night the night Obama won. We were at this just this party, and you're like, <laughs> Well, on the one hand, I feel like the forces of democracy have come together. <laughs> and on the other hand, I feel like I did when I when the when the in, insert racist term when the gook shoved the uh, <laughs> one of their demon god statues up where the small meets the large. <laughs> was not, uh, they shoved. Let me tell you what happened to me when I was when I was when I was shoved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rough, rough shit. Rough yeah. shit. Yeah. Um, he, he ran on it. That was like his argument. Demon God. Hmm? Their demon God. On the one, hand, it was so good, so so good, reasonable McCain to absolute psychopath McCain. He would always do one, that. He would always do that. There was always a flip back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Light switch that would go off. Yeah. Uh, he was good on torture, though. Good on torture. And the only, I mean, policy Maybe because wise. he experienced it. Yeah. No, I know. And in fact, you know, I have to have him back on, John Kiriakou. We had him on Useful Idiots. You know, John Kiriakou? Yes. I, yeah. I, fol I followed his uh, blog when he was in prison. Yeah. And he says there's one, well, I gave it away now. I was going to get say, guess who it is? You'll know. There's one person who, one member of Senate who defended him because he's out of jail, but he lost his pension. John Kiraku, the one person to go to jail out of so John everyone. John McCain said he's got to keep his pension. <laughs> All right. Good for you. Good for you. For, yeah. And Kiriaku, by the way, the only person to go to jail related to CIA torturing is the one who blew the whistle. Yep. Um, and so, yep. Uh, all right, we're going to switch gears, but I just want to thank Nevadical. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, oh, that's and cool. it's cool. James doing his Kyle Rittenhouse in prison impression. I don't know. With that big mic. Oh, I thought that. Well, thank you for the suggestion. And uh, let's go to. I tend to do tend to do impressions of public figures, not just. Uh, yeah, you don't want to do. You don't want to like random terrorist perps. Yeah, right. Um, I thought that was a, a reference to me, and of course Gorka. But anyway. All right, so let's talk. I will. I'll get McCain on the show. Um, let's talk about Armenia. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to come on and talk about it. It's been crazy because it's been such a uh, insane news week with the in America the talk of um, political uncertainty with the transition and the election. Um, with the roiling news cycle from the debate now into the president having coronavirus 
and unfortunately uh it seems it's quite plausible that azerbaijan and turkey were totally aware that the world media attention would be on the presidential debate in the united states and may have even chosen this moment to launch this recent new war on armenia um it's a it's it's a terrible thing that this tiny underdog country of Armenia has gone through. I have Armenian heritage, um, I, I so I, I I know I I follow the news. I know what's happening. It does not get a lot of attention in U.S. media. It gets some attention in like European right. media, but honestly, the BBC, the BBC is. Uh, only concerned about oil pipelines in the region and stuff. So their coverage is really bad. Um, and nobody, like Emmanuel Macron actually was impressive. He, he let it be known that uh, France would not accept a uh, military conquest of Azerbaijan against uh, Artsakh, the Armenian region. That's the source of the contention. He, he said that, uh, France would not accept a Turkish and Azerbaijani invasion of Artsakh, uh, which was nice to hear a world leader say. By and large, the Armenian people have been totally alone. And uh, it's, it's, it, we, the Armenian people have suffered so much for centuries. Just over 100 years ago, there was the Armenian genocide um, where the Ottoman Turks of the Ottoman Empire attempted to basically extinguish the entire Armenian ethnicity. Uh, or by the put, way, I'm looking at my phone because I'm going to put links to what we're talking about. I'm oh, yes, I sent you a it. couple of links. Yeah. So that was that was, that was a, a genocide that happened between 1915 and then in subsequent years after that during World War I. And basically, the vast majority of the traditional Armenian homeland... Uh, th where the Armenian people are the indigenous people who evolved there uh, were wiped out. They were wiped out in their own indigenous homeland uh, because Turkish nationalists during World War I decided like we can't have any ethnic minorities. Um, and so there's this tiny remnant of Armenia that was just where the Russians controlled in, at the end of World War I so the Turks couldn't get there. And that's what Armenia is today. And it fell under Soviet control for 70 years. And Joseph Stalin uh, infamously uh, cut off uh, the ethnic Armenian uh, area of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh and gave it to Azerbaijan. Uh, so because, Georgians. Yes, because <laughs> that's... Can't I mean, trust a Georgian. <laughs> you like I, like Jim, McCall, Jim McCall always says, can't trust a Georgian as far as I can throw him. <laughs> you can't you can't trust the Georgian if they're in Atlanta or if they're on the wrong side of the Caucasus. <laughs> um, this is something the Armenians say is that is that uh, Stalin, being an ethnic Georgian, had like rivalry issues with the Armenians and wanted to keep them down, and so took like a majority Armenian area, Artsakh, and made it the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. In any case, um. The, Turkey to this day does not recognize that what they did in World War One was a genocide against the Armenians. Uh, they simultaneously, have, they don't have a very well thought out denial <laughs> argument because simultaneously they say it didn't happen and that it's good that it did happen and that yeah. they would do it again. Yeah. So the, the Turkish policy is like, watch out, we'll genocide you like we did 100 years ago, which we didn't do. When we never did, yeah. But, but we'll do it again. Right. But this um, time it'll be real. And Azerbaijan follows suit because Azerbaijan is basically the, the Turkic people, Turkic ethnicity that was under Russian rule for several hundred years. And so they feel a great affinity for the Turkish people of what is now Turkey in Anatolia. Um, so there's this extermination. There is to this day an exterminationist anti-Armenian racism uh, on the part of not all, but many uh, Turkish nationalists and uh, Azerbaijani nationalists, Azeri nationalists. And um, you don't have to even take an Armenian's word for that. 
you can you, you can literally go to any active social media page from uh, any of thousands of Turkish nationalist or Azerbaijani nationalist Twitter accounts. And what they'll be saying over and over again is the Armenians aren't a real people. They don't deserve any country or homeland at all. We're going to conquer Yerevan. Um, we're going to do a genocide again. They're openly exterminationist rhetoric. And that's like, that's like their side. And the Armenian right. side is we would like to live in the a small sliver that is left over of the uh, indigenous homeland that we evolved in for Bunch thousands of, of years. Princesses. So yeah, that's the that's the sort of like large context for what's happening in the short term. Very recently, what happened is um, there's a standstill between Azerbaijan and Armenia since the 1990s when. Azerbaijan, as soon as the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, Armenia declared independence. All the other little republics, including Azerbaijan, declared independence. Immediately, there were ethnic pogroms against Armenians in the Azerbaijan capital of Baku. Uh, deadly, uh, um, uh, deadly pogroms. Um, because in Soviet times and even before then, there was like uh, different ethnicities living in each other's countries and cities and stuff. And then there was an attempted and attempted mass uh, massacres in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is the Armenian enclave. And then the Armenians uh, of that area were backed up by the neighboring Armenian Republic. And together the Armenian people said, no, you're not going to do it. We're not going to sit here and let you pogrom us. We're not going to let you massacre us. So uh, they rose up and they created their own autonomous Republic. And it happened at the same time that the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and so there is an autonomous Armenian Republic of Artsakh that is adjacent to the Republic of Armenia. And the, the, in, Ar Azerbaijan still claims it um, as part of their territory. And so what happened, it's, it, there's been a flare up over and over again over the years. Azerbaijan and Turkey have a big pipeline that's funded by British Petroleum. The, uh, that goes around Armenia, but it goes very close to where Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh is. Um, Turkey has had a blockade of Armenia for 25 years or something, or almost 30 years since the first uh, uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Uh, so the border of Armenia is closed on both sides between Azerbaijan and Turkey. Their neighbors to the north, Georgia, are not very friendly, even though it's a Christian nation. It's it's it. There's an eth, there's a um, religious quality to this dispute, but it's not really a religious conflict. It's more of an ethnic conflict. Mm -hmm. So the Georgians are like Christians, like the Armenians, but they 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 don't help. They don't they don't really. They're not uh, friends. So Armenia is like totally landlocked and isolated with hostile two genocidally hostile neighbors on the east and the west. An indifferent neighbor to the north, Georgia, that doesn't want to help at all. Uh, Iran is the only country that borders them that open that has a road open that actually will supply them with anything. And Russia doesn't have a border, but they, you know, there's airplane flights and there there is a, a defense treaty with Russia. But they use Armenia as like a bargaining chip in their geopolitical strategies with Turkey and stuff. They're never really out to help the Armenian people. Uh, and this can be seen now with this current war where Azerbaijan and Turkey held uh, war games like a month ago in Azerbaijan with the explicit. It was a, it was a, a rehearsal for the current war. Uh, it was a rehearsal for invading Armenia. Um, and this comes at a time when Turkey is currently at war with almost all of its neighbors. Turkey is now at war with Armenia. Uh, not just by proxy, the Turkish Air Force is violating Armenian airspace proper uh, and has been for several days now, let alone the military uh, coordination that they're helping out Azerbaijan with. Um, they're also involved in the war in Libya, uh, threatening an out-and-out -out war with Egypt, and they're still involved with their military occupation of Syria and northern Iraq, and they're um internal conflict with their ethnic kurdish minority and also they've been threatening a war with greece and cyprus and france over uh mediterranean oil drilling rights uh erdogan is the dictator of turkey and he he likes war 
he likes war and he and i think the international community is starting to see this that the state of turkey today is controlled by a nationalist madman who is trying to start wars everywhere because their economy is in trouble the turkish lira is collapsing in an epic fashion and it's it's it keeps collapsing further than anyone thought it could and um and so in this context is what happened is that, you know, they had war games, they planned for the invasion. And then uh, a week ago, it's been one week, uh, Azerbaijan launched a, a surprise attack on Karabakh and also uh, positions in the Republic of Armenia. Um, Karabakh is the Azerbaijani word and the Armenian word is Artsakh. So it's, I'll say Artsakh. Um, so they launched a surprise attack and made some very minimal gains initially. And then uh, the Armenians have been fighting tooth and nail against uh, Armenia is a country of, I believe, three million people or less than three million people. Uh, the Republic of Artsakh is like a population of 150,000. Azerbaijan is a country of 10 million. And this is to say nothing of their allies right over the border of uh or just you know right a hop over armenia their allies turkey is a huge country with one of the biggest militaries in the world armenia is up against a uh a three to one uh, more than a three to one uh population disadvantage and a uh, great disadvantage in military uh materiel and um weapons um uh, azerbaijan is backed up uh by uh, and, and sold weapons by a lot of major powers in the world um, and the Armenians have fought them off this underdog country uh, against all odds with no help and very little news coverage because it's <laughs> to Americans. It's like, eh, it sounds like uh, too far away. It's Dan for me to care about it. Right. And yeah, well, I don't care how many people, I don't care how many millions of people die. <laughs> um, it, it's daytime there when it's nighttime over here. Right. Snooze. Yeah. And so we ignore it and we ignore it and we ignore it. And unfortunately, the Turkish nationalists and the Azeri nationalists see that the West ignores their aggressions and that um, encourages them to keep it up. So we have now seen a week of terrible attacks from Azerbaijan against Armenia and Armenian Artsakh. Uh, and they have failed on the battlefield largely against all odds. The Armenians stopped them on the battlefield uh, with some uh, incredible bravery and, and cleverness. And so Turkey and Azerbaijan are getting angry that their plan is failing. And uh, yesterday and today they have switched to more of attack, uh, more of a tactic of just directly attacking civilian populations, which is just, it's, Yes, if you could say, yeah, it's a war crime. Everything they've done has been a war crime. They're, right. they're targeting journalists. They're firing heavy rockets from uh, residential air from civilian areas, which is a war crime. It's human shielding, uh, you know, human shields. They're firing heavy rockets at the Artsakh capital of Stepanakert at residential areas, at homes, deliberately, because they're getting angry that they're not making the um progress that they wanted to on the ground on the battlefield so they're now they're decide like all right well if we're not gonna win this war that way we're going to extract a price of human lives from you by attacking children and civilians in their homes and so that's what's happening now miraculously the armenians have uh uh they're in their bunkers they're fighting back. They're fighting tooth and nail. In many ways, it is a um, it is a fight for the survival of Armenia. Um, <laughs> I, it's a fight for the survival of Armenia because um, I think the Western media is waiting for like oh, I gotta wait to see if it gets worse before I yeah. take a side on this. If it gets any worse, the only way it could get any worse than it is now is if there's a major genocidal event uh where a major armenian populated city gets taken over or some disaster like that which would immediately result in a massacre because unfortunately there's almost no exceptions uh when 
Turkish nationalists or Turkish-backed mercenaries enter a city, the first thing that goes is the Armenian population because there is an irrational, insane ethnic hatred that goes back centuries. Um, it, now that I mentioned it, with the mercenaries, that was another, thing, another war crime that they've committed. <laughs> Turkey has been flying plane loads of its hired mercenaries from its dirty war in Libya to Azerbaijan, paying them $1,000 a month uh, to explicitly these terrorists, Turkish-backed terrorists from Libya, explicitly paying them to fight Azerbaijan's war for them and uh, attack Armenians, who did nothing to deserve this, who did nothing to deserve this, who simply evolved in an area that was has been conquered a bunch of times. I mean, the Armenian people are ancient. It's an older it's an older culture than the ancient Rome. They were they. If you go read ancient Roman politics, like on their eastern border, they're dealing with Armenians. <laughs> And so not they, the Armenians again. We were, they, were they were sandwiched with, between several different Persian empires and uh, you know the Greeks and the Romans on the other side. And so they've been around a long time. They won some and they lost some. They're still around from ancient times with a continuous culture, and they didn't do anything to deserve this. And it's heartbreaking because I get, I get, I get that a lot of Americans are like, oh, I mean, oh, the Armenians always complaining about the Turks. Well, I really wish we didn't have to. Yeah. I really wish we didn't fucking have to. It would be absolutely nice if Armenians could pursue things like Armenians are great engineers and great artists, uh, scientists, engineers, artists, um, um, intelligent people, athletes. Armenians just want to be alive right. and solve great problems that are of interest to the future of humanity. It is uh, tragic that over and over and over again at the whim of whatever dictator happens to be in control of Turkey, be it Erdogan or Azerbaijan, be it Aliyev, that Armenians have to stop everything and fight a war for survival whenever some Turkish madman feels like it, whenever some Azeri nationalist wants to prove he's a tough guy. The survival of the Armenian people is at stake, not just in Artsakh, but in Yerevan because of how small the country is. And the Armenians are not being helped by anybody right now. So I would just say, if there are people out there now, A, if you're a journalist or an editor, I know a lot of Armenians who are, A, trying to get interviewed on the news, trying to submit an op-ed, get their story told. Armenians in Armenia who are currently like in air raid yeah. bunkers. Um, Armenians who fled, you know, who've been there recently and are now in California or whatever. Um, there's a lot of Armenians who are trying to get, media exposure in the United States. Um, and also, um, it would be nice if it, it would be nice if someone would help. It would be nice if someone would help. So far, for an entire week, with very little attention, the Armenian people have fought off uh, an attempt, again, to erase them from history. Um, they need help. They need help. Because... Turkey's a big country. Turkey's a big and powerful country. And Armenia needs help. There's international, you know, the, the Turkey and Azerbaijan are breaking a lot of laws. There's even more international laws that they could be breaking. There's Turkish, famous Turbic Turkish media figure who's allied with Erdogan politically suggested on Twitter this week that uh, publicly that Turk, that Turkey should accidentally drop a bomb on the Yerevan nuclear reactor in the capital of Armenia. And that's just like a standard thing that gets said in Turkish, Turkish nationalist circuit, circles. And it is like you're just allowed to say something genocidal like that against right. Armenians. And there's a danger that some mani that he's Erdogan being such a maniac that he'll do it. Right. So we could use some help. We could use some attention. We could use some news coverage. If you work in the media, um, there's a lot of Armenians who know who are know a lot more about me than what's going on. I'm following it from a distance. Um, there's also ways to help. And uh, yeah, as of now, no country is helping Armenia. Uh, there are a lot of people and individuals who are helping Armenia. And uh I know the Armenian people are grateful for the help that they do get. If it's not going to be from any country, then they're grateful for the help that they get from the people who will help from the people who, um, from the people who realize that, uh, the Armenian people have had a, a role in human history for 
many thousands of years as an ancient culture uh, with continuous connections to ancient times and deserve a role long into the future for the rest of human history as well. Um, so how can people help? Someone already asked. I'm glad you asked. Uh, first and foremost. And thank you, Gene, for that question. Yeah, thanks for the question, Gene. First and foremost, there is a website. There's two addresses. The e easy English language address is, is it's for the All Armenia Fund. And so the address is armeniafund.org. That's A-R-M-E-N-I-A-F-U-N-D, armeniafund.org. And there's also the Armenian version of the same organization, which you can, it's called himnadram.org, which is H-I-M-N-A-D-R-A-M, himnadram.org. I'll put all the links in here and then on YouTube, mm -hmm. but yeah, keep going. And Sorry. you can also, and this, that, that, that is like the unified help and resource and aid uh, donation fund just that is, for donations to help the Armenian people and the Armenian people of Artsakh. A great news resource that I love, uh, follow them on social media, and I watch them here in the United States. Uh, I believe they're based, I believe one of their headquarters in Los Angeles, because we have an Armenian population here. Uh, Zartank Media. Uh, Zartank Media, I think it's, let me double check. What's the I have it, it's coming next. Yeah, it's zartankmedia.com. <laughs> yeah. Zartankmedia.com. Uh, they're also on Twitter and uh, on Instagram and other social media. And I'm having a, uh, I'm learning a lot following them. And uh, finally, uh, there's the Armenian National Committee of America. They do a lot of political activity um, uh, in the United States on behalf of the Armenian people. And their website right now, where they're alerting people to what's happening urgently in Armenia and in Artsakh, is uh anka.org slash alert it's anka which is the acronym for armenian national committee of america so it's anca.org slash alert so first off if you can help armeniafund.org secondly if you want to follow the news that's happening zartankmedia.com and third for uh, alerts from anka it's anka.org slash alert and uh if you pray, pray for Armenia. Uh, if you don't pray, um, donate, help, help or in other tweet, ways. or help in other get ways. the word out. Yeah. The Armenian people are proud that they're the, the Armenia is the first Christian nation in the world from like 300, 301 AD was the first nation to become Christian. Wow. And also, there's a whole lot of Armenian uh, atheists and a whole lot of pagan Armenians now today too, since yeah. Soviet times. But um, if you pray, pray for Armenia. And if you help and if you if you love humanity, please keep the Armenian people uh, uh, in your minds. Sparky in, point. In a, okay. dire, in a dire time of existential need. Yeah. Also, a great way for the resistance to chime in. Trump likes Erdogan. He's a monster. Well, it's true. Trump it's has, yeah. Trump has, uh, you know, Trump has been like, oh, I'm, I'm Kim Kardashian, like friends with Kim Kardashian. Oh, but, yeah. But, but Trump really, the, the. Yeah, are the know, Kardashians talking about this? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, they're doing a great job. But uh, Trump um, really tried to stop the recognition of the Armenian genocide in the United States Senate and, and really leaned on a couple of senators to, to hold it up. And it passed up, up over Trump's objection. Wow. The U.S. Congress recognized the Armenian genocide finally after more than 100 years um, because they did that because the establishment is slowly realizing that Turkey is a terrible ally. Right. They're, they're in the NATO alliance, but they are absolutely terrible allies. They, they basically, they have, they, 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 everybody they've ever been allied with in history, they've stabbed in the back. Can't think of an exception at the moment. Um, but the Greeks, you know, Greeks really. If you go to Astoria, a lot of fuck the Turks. There's fuck well, the there's, Turks uh, graffiti there. There are there are Turkish people who this does not apply to. Of course, right, right, right. They're not. They're talking about the Turks, like the occupying, not yeah, individual. And I will say, Azerbaijan is striking civilian areas in Armenia. Still, after a week of this war, the Armenians are not. They're not doing the same. They're not. Right. They're not targeting residential areas of Azerbaijan. Uh, it, part of that is that they're they're 
be, they're forced to fight a defensive war. They can't take offensive measures outside of their borders right now. But uh, recent Turkish history has been not very good to most of its neighbors and most of its ethnic minorities. And I think belatedly the United States think tank establishment is understanding that. Yeah. Uh, also, someone, Sparky, thank you for pointing out, apparently Armenian invented rice a -roni. Is that, I don't know if that's a joke. I don't, <laughs> I, don't know. It's true. I don't know if that's true. I should actually, I should know that. I know an Armenian invented Albin and chipmunks. Really? Yeah. Um, I know. Uh, Cher is Armenian. A lot of people wouldn't know that because the big giveaway with Armenians, of course, is the last name. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Adomian. If you can, if you drop, if you drop it, and you have a one word name like Cher, then maybe not everybody's gonna know it. Maybe I just realized she's a self loathing Armenian. Oh no, she's proud. She does. She she does a lot. She does a lot. All right, all right. It's not my place. It's certainly not my place. I'm just saying. I would, you know, why not? Share? She should make it Sherian. Why me? I mean, it's this, okay. It, it's Madonna. I, is, I guess Madonna is Ita an Italian word too. Right? You're, it, there, exactly. She kept it. She kept uh, her. Yeah. What's her real name? Step. What is her real name? I Madonna. actually don't know. She's done remember. such a good, good job. She's done such a good. I don't know. Shared either. Yeah. Um. If you're a booker, if you're a booker on a major Armenian news organization, organization, I am not. Like I'm just. I'm. I'm like a guy. There's like real Armenian spokespeople and stuff that cannot get on television right now when they absolutely should be able to. And I understand there's a big domestic U.S. news story. Yeah. Can you please put us on at 1 a.m.? Like, yeah. get, get Serge Tonkin on TV. I've got a goddamn list here of a bunch of Armenians that are champing at the bit to do interviews. If you work for a news organization, contact the Armenian National Committee of America. They've got the list. Yeah. I'll I've do it. List, you're my, yeah. you're my gateway. You're, I mean, you're the gateway. I want it. Yeah. You're, I'll, I'm hoping, you know, it's hard to make this sexy, but James Jumming is funny and sexy. So you're the, Thank the you. gateway. You're the gateway. Per, you're the gateway Armenian. I like, actually, I like, that's good. I like, right? I like that a lot. I like that a lot. It's really good. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think I'm Armenian enough, but I like that. I'm the gateway Armenian. Yeah. Gateway <laughs> Armenian. Yeah. Uh, and you're speaking of Armenians liking to contribute. Um, people should know that James's grandfather was a major mathematician. He was a well-known mathematician. Yeah, George Adomian. Uh, he developed the Adomian decomposition method, which is a, a method for solving um, uh, partial differential stochastic equations. Uh, I use I it all the time. I, I know, right? I use it every day. You know, yeah. I use, how I, I compost. When I go shopping and stuff, yeah. But his work is studied by a lot of grad students, and ironically, um, there's even like Turkish uh, mathematicians and uh, grad students that study his work. His work is studied in Ar Armenia. His work is studied in the U.S. His work is studied in France. Ironically, it's also studied in Istanbul, because um, if we can get past the nationalism and the um, ethnic hatred, there can be a future. There could be a future where there is not a government in Turkey or in Azerbaijan that wants to exterminate the Armenian people or punish the Armenian people or massacre the Armenian people. There can be peace. There can be peace. Um, there can be peace if we pay attention to the war that's happening right now. Yeah. I'm just looking at it. I'm looking at a list of famous Armenians to see if they can. Uh, the Bogosians, obviously. Oh, Eric Bogosian would be great. I have this list, but it's not on this page. Um, oh, okay. It's a lot of my friends. It's a lot of my friends too. I've got a bunch of friends, and I'm not sure if I should, you know, mention them right now in this context right now. Yeah. But I know a lot of people who are very talented Armenian artists who are will willing to drop everything, not pursue the the work that they work on in their real life, and and again, address racism and ethnic violence on a national, on an on a existential level against the Armenian people. A uh, goddamn gen. Right. But anyway, uh, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for giving me a chance to get the message out. Uh, that's pretty much the most I can say in a concise fashion. Um, you speak any Armenian? 
Uh, I do. Uh, or I could say, uh, kich me hairini. What's that bit. mean? A little bit. A little bit. Nice. Uh, I can say the little things that you say to, you know, Barev. As the gateway Armenian. Barev, Shnora Kaletun, Bari Geshir. Um, so I want to, I, 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 I want, I want the Armenians to know that they're not alone. And if you agree that Armenians should feel that they're not alone, please help us. Armeniafund.org, Zartankmedia.com, Anka.org slash alert. That's A N C A. Great. Thank and you. we put it there. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to make sure we mention? Dita Von Tees is also Armenian, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to confuse people with that. too much. Follow Zartonk. Yeah. Follow Zartonk. They've got in-depth stuff about history. They've got cutting-edge stuff about the news. Anka, the Armenian National Committee of America, has all the stuff about the political angle uh, regarding like the U.S. and Western governments. And like I said, the All Armenia Fund at armeniafund.org is a way for anybody out there to directly help uh, Armenia and Artsakh with humanitarian aid. In a time when children have been forced to evacuate their home, children have died. I don't like dwelling on that. I don't like yeah. talking about it. Children have died. Many civilians have died. Um, and they're, they are keeping their spirits up in air raid bunkers right now throughout Artsakh and throughout parts of Armenia proper. Turkish and Azerbaijani aircraft were intercepted by... Um, uh, uh, anti -air, Armenian anti-aircraft uh, batteries in the suburban region of Yerevan yesterday. Um, so it's it, it, it's mostly a, a attack of Azerbaijan against Artsakh, but it's they're also attacking Armenia whenever they feel like it to test to see if they can get away with it. Um, and again, it's such a small country that if things go bad, that's it. Right. the next the next escalate you might hear that oh well the armenians are gone and that don't let that be your cue to maybe step up and help right it's a tiny yeah. country it's a tiny country there can a lot of people compare armenians to to they're like the jews of the caucasus the jews, the i mean there were jews armenia. there too but yeah i know i don't know of that there's region a, yeah there's a lot of uh uh, many Jewish families and many Armenian families in America know that there's uh, that's a pretty eligible intermarrying match uh, on many occasions. Many yeah. mixed, um, in my family as well, many mixed. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Know. Many mixed Jewish and Armenian families uh, in America. A lot of genocidal based pillow talk. <laughs> that's uh, or, but you know, hopefully by now, like maybe there's something else. <laughs> yeah. Most, most days yeah. of the year. Right. But yeah, similar struggles, <laughs> similar struggles, uh, similar roles under oppression, uh, oppressive societies, right. oppressive larger empires, sort of like, you know, forbidden from op owning land and forced right. to pick up tr intelligent trades and so forth. Good with the money. <laughs> yeah. Terrible, but it's true. A lot of this stuff, with, I have to have Christian Parenti on. I didn't realize this. A lot of anti Semit, a lot of pogroms were just liquidate, like debt liquidation. Yeah, that's tough. To think Christ, about. really, James, of all people. Thank you. Actually, he's one of ours. <laughs> he's a lot of great things for you people. Yeah. Yes. Like the Palestinians. I know. Sorry. I don't mean to be defensive. I just I'm a Jew who's trust me. My the default of my family is not with Israel. In fact, the other day, my dad. Kind of, well, I won't get into it, but yeah. Um, um Yes. Yes, I thank thank you for thank you for hearing me out, Katie. I really yeah. appreciate it. Of course, yeah. I really and um, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully things will turn around. Hopefully, the whole you know the world that is paying attention is screaming at everybody like, "Stop the fighting! Stop the fighting! Stop the fighting!" It didn't help that there was a in Armenia there was like marches for peace. There was like big rallies in the summertime for like let's have peace. In Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, there was a thirty thousand person march in favor of war. Which is like that's not what you're supposed to march for. Right. <laughs> you're Someone supposed to have anti-war marches. Right. Yeah. Were they like that? Did they have like whatever, like anti-peace? I'm just imagining a bunch of like people hippied out with protest signs, except it's like pro-war. Mm, I don't know. Mm, probably they, not. I probably know that there's like, like a, a nationalist. Yeah. There's like a nationalist um, um, 
Turkish gray wolves hand signal that I don't particularly want to do, but sometimes they do that at, at, at nationalist rallies and stuff. But uh, yeah. I don't know. Again, again, uh, not all Turks and not all Azeris are bad people or enemies of the of Armenian existence, um, but they're not in political power right now. And uh, right. it, 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 we need the international community to come together um, to have more peaceful ways of reconciling uh, historical differences and yeah. s- stop shooting heavy rockets at residential areas, at apartment buildings, at apartment buildings and, um, and homes, private, res- private residences and schools and hospitals. And Vans marked press have been specifically targeted by Azerbaijan as well because they banned the press from their territory and they claim that Artsakh is their territory. So they've said that no press is allowed. So they're totally able to go shoot them if they want or blow up their vans or whatever. It's a real shit show. It's a real shit show. Um, we're in the middle of a movie that has no ending yet. And it's a horror could, film. Well, it could be, or it could be a real a hero, uh, a story of oh, yeah. uh, human triumph. Right. It, it the act act one of the movie certainly is a horror show. Right. So, um, hey, uh, step up and h- help to make this a good story that gets told in the future. Yes. Yeah. And I'll go if people want to donate. Again, uh, there are those links there. Um. ArmeniaFund.org, ZartankMedia.com, yeah, a- ANC.org. Those are the those are the links to remember. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, let's I'll talk li- to this. Oh, so should, I don't really want it. Hey, if you pay me some money, Ed Kemper, I'll respond to you. There's some troll in here. Who called me I, horse face, which is so I, funny because I don't have that. Uh, I, there's so many Azri trolls. If you post anything as an Ar- Armenian online, you just immediately get uh, death threats, threats for the extermination of your ethnicity, uh, an endless right. number of Turkish flags. Look at any post that Kim Kardashian does about Armenia, even if she doesn't mention Turkey. It's just endless right. racist intimidation. And since there's so few Armenians in the world, uh, the social media companies, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, don't care. Like Turkish and Azeri. Right, there's no, yeah. Yeah, Turkish and Azeri racist intimidation of Armenians like doesn't get flagged as racist because they're like, yawn, we don't have a guy on staff to even know what that is. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, and of course... This is a cyber war as well as a war on the ground. Uh, uh, a lot of Armenian web pages and charities and social media accounts got taken down in the first two days of the war because the Turks tried to silence the Armenians while they were carrying out their opening stages of their attack. Um, and they continue to wage a war with a lot of they have a population advantage. So that means they have an advantage in botnets and paid trolls. Right. Um, so unfortunately there's a lot of that shit that we have to deal with too well but thank you oh, but we're, we, we're we are we are we have survived now for a week armenia has survived this war for a week now we have survived worse this this could fall off the rails or it could humanity could be spared the worst to say nothing of the danger of the fact that if russia gets involved it's a nuclear power and and Turkey is a NATO member, which is which is so catastrophically bad. And that's why you need to realize that the struggle that Armenia is facing right now is also a struggle that the rest of the world is involved in, whether it yawns about it and cares to know the details or not. It is a armed struggle with no with intense ethnic hatred on one side and no solution in sight and the possibility of a nuclear escalation looming on the horizon. Yeah. So um, I think I think it's in the best interest of humanity to uh, start paying more attention and, and helping peace be achieved immediately. 
Yeah. I should have on Kachik Tololian, a NATO, uh, NATO uh, an Armenian, obviously, Tololian professor who started this book, this journal called Diaspora. He was like my favorite professor at Wesleyan. Yes. Do. I'll reach out to him. Do. Yeah. Um, you're, you're always great to talk to. You're always up on the issues mm. and you can be funny and serious. You guys, Thank you, know, you. You, know what, you know what a treasure it is to have a friend like Katie Halper. I, I, oh. I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't get to see you. I, I haven't been, haven't been able to make it to New York in a while. I know. Oh wait, I want to ask you: Have you been to um, have you been to Armenia? No, I was trying and trying, and I I could never I, I I can't do comedy in Armenian, so I had to go as a tourist. I didn't want to go alone. It's yeah. halfway around the world. Right. I've been trying to go for three years and never had like a two week period where I could get someone to go with me and I could like not work on stuff here. And I need to, I almost went last year. I just couldn't pull it together. Do you have family there? Distant, distant relatives, but no, we're, my Armenians are the Armenian where I'm descended from the Armenians. Uh, they're called Western Armenians. I'm, I'm descended from the Armenians is the Vaughn province in the city of Vaughn. And if you look at a map, it's on Turkey. It's in the, borders of Turkey today, and there are almost no Armenians there now. The Armenians that remain in the Vaughan province uh, had to basically kind of like uh, pretend that they weren't Armenian in order to survive. Uh, so there's now and here, in, and that's a whole, that's a whole, that's another discussion is like the Turkish people who find out that they're actually all Armenian or half Arme crypto Armenians. Yes. But the Armenian population of Vaughn mostly doesn't exist anymore. They were forced mm. out. Uh, they were forced out in the genocide and became part of the diaspora. And so, my ancestors yeah. are Armenian Americans from Vaughn. Vonitsis. Vonitsis, that's what it's called. Vonitsi, yeah. Vonitsi, that's, oh, cool. that's that particular uh, uh, brand of Armenian. Nice. Well. God, the whatever willing, Bodhi, my dog who's in the city right now, Bodhi willing, there will be peace. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry about this. And this is really uh, something that should be paid attention to and isn't. Uh, what about Anna Kasparian? You got to get her talking <laughs> you about you this. Know, you know her better than I do. Katie, I got to give it to you. You're, you're, this isn't, you're not even a breaking news reporter. You're, you're, you're like ahead of there. This has basically not made it on any television news yeah. in the United States. A, a democracy major, now. Yeah, democracy now has not covered it, and I so you're a couple days ago for a thing. Yeah, did they briefly give a blind eye? Uh, what do you call it? Flashing news item. You're ahead of the curve. Yeah. This is the most in-depth discussion about the war of Azerbaijan against Armenia that's happened all week in the United yeah. States. So thank you, Katie Halper. Thank you. And I'll have you more. I'll a, have more people. You deserve a Peabody Award for this. Pea brain. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and I will, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I'll, some people at the gray zone should write about it. What's I'm that? Sure. Uh we I'll talk to some well, I'll make some phone calls. I'll make some calls. Make sure people know about it. This, but really uh, helper, I will. Helper switchboard. Yeah, helper switchboard, yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, apparently, RT has good coverage of it. That's all. That always happens. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 there, there's a bias there. Uh, but yeah, right. they, they are covering it. They're a lot closer geographically. Right. Yeah. When I their, yeah. bi their bias, I would say, is there's a, there's a pro Russian bias, and Russia's oh, of course, of course, there is. I mean, I don't go to Russia to find out about like you, you know, Crimea and Ukraine. Right. I mean, to Russia to, to RT, but it's gone on they're, a lot of things. There, uh, that's the big mystery: is what's Russia Russia going to do? That's what everybody's kind of like waiting and watching to see. Anyway, it's a tough situation. Yeah. Well, yeah, get Joe Rogan on it. I I would laugh. I think that Joe Rogan should. I, Thanks, I don't have I don't have any connection to Joe Rogan, but I think he should obviously have Serge Tonkin on as soon as possible. Yeah. System of a Down, Serge Tonkin, a great spokesman for the Armenian people, knows a lot more than I do. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and I think um, he's famous enough Maybe. that Joe Rogan might have him on. Yeah. 
You hear that? People may not know that he's Armenian. So you should be plugging that a lot. Um, and um, okay. Thank you again so much, James. Come back on. Thank you, oh, I Katie. like this. I'll read this out loud. Thank you. Katie is as personal as Joe Rogan as smart and wise as Chomsky. I'll take the I'll say uh, the first one without a doubt. Yeah, I think so. That's a slicey. That's a slicey compliment. Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, okay. Uh, and James, thank you for coming on. Come on again, and um, yeah, maybe we can do a. You should do one of our drinking games with us. I would love to. Thank you so much. Love thank to you. see you always, Katie. Thank you. Yeah, me too. And James is the thing I was going to say before is that's how I knew when we met. He was so smart. He's like obviously hilarious but also so smart and could respond in the funniest ways to questions as george bush in a very very like policy-ish ways because james and by the way you gotta listen to the interviews i did with him i'll make yeah. them on pub one of them's behind the you know patreon but I, i'll i'll unblock unlock it um very good um uh interview where we go in depth on some things and about his life and how he became politicized oh, and he used yeah. to be on the right yeah, it was yeah, really yeah, good. Yeah, a couple years yeah. ago. Yeah. It's always great to talk to you. I hope I'll get to see you again. Yeah. Uh, and Thanks, not, in, not in the Dr. Strange love way. I know. Yeah. We'll be able to talk about something other than that. I'll stay on for a little bit to chat with people and make fun of Rachel Maddow and stuff. Um, thank you again so much, James. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. All right. That was fun. That was fun. Uh, yeah. It's true. I am bad at saying goodbye. Check out the Duran. Oh, the Armenian news. Okay, I will make sure people do that. This was, this was, I mean, it was good. It was good. It was sad. It was good. I should have Anna on. Um, what else? Anything else people want to make sure we talk about? Um, thank you so much, everyone who chipped in tonight. Um, anything else we want to talk about? Want to make sure we talk about? Uh, has everyone liked and uh, subscribed and shared and all that jazz? Um, yeah, James is great. He's such a good impersonator. Glad we got some of those, uh, uh, <laughs> you hang up first. Stupid. Glad we got some of those, uh, funny, you know, you got to lead with the comedy. So I'll do, cut up some clips probably from, of his impersonations and then we can, you know, again, the gateway, the gateway comedy, the gateway, uh, the gateway, um, yeah, the gateway um, Armenian. I like that. Yeah, I'm still friends with Jimmy Dore. I'm gonna have him back on. I'm uh, and I gotta really. I have a lot of backed up episodes. Um, yeah, the useful idiots. Let's see. Lisa says the useful idiots segment was hilarious. You mean the penis one? Um, it was very funny. Um, what else? Um. Um, that was pretty funny. Yeah, I'll get Jimmy Dore on. How do I get notified? Okay, someone says, Katie, I missed the live show. How do I get notified when you're on? I don't know. Can you tell me? I don't know how to do it. Anyone know? Um, oh my God, the Jesse Ventura was like amazing. But how, do you know how I, how I do that? The live thingy, Merjingy? Because I don't actually know. Um... Anyone know? Oh, by the way, guys, let me, I already have this. You know what? I'm going to do this right. Can I, let's see if I click the bell, click the bell, the bell icon. Are you guys ready for this? Matt Taibbi and I are doing another drinking game. So that's called vice presidential, right? Vice presidential drinking, uh, drinking game. Wait till you see the image I did of this. Hold on. Schedule for later. We're going to do 8.30 on Wednesday. Isn't it crazy? You think it's still going to be held? Apparently it is. They say it is. 7th. It's perfect. It's right when you, you uh, live. It's right when I do my live stream. Coincidence? You be the judge. All right. Let's see. Vice presidential drinking game. I even made a great image for it. Hold on. Oh, the bell appears after you hit the red subscribe button. You see, I don't even know about this stuff. Hold on. I'm so proud of this image. Okay, vice presidential live. And then I'm also have, I have a great lineup for Sunday. 
We're going to make that. Hold on. Let me just add this. Uh, I got a really great lineup for Sunday. We got joining the show. You know who's coming on Sunday? A little Aaron Mate. Pretty good, right? So Aaron Mate is going to be on the show. And Ken Klippenstein. Really great guest. I'm Bye, everyone. See you Sunday night with Aaron Mate and Ken Klippenstein. And then see you Wednesday night for the live stream drinking game. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Brad. And thank you, Phil, for thanking them. Uh, okay, bye.